Oh, you guys can hear it now, right? The music? Now, I'm curious to see if the, the live chat will automatically pop up if I set that for, properly. Can one of you two um, check to see if I'm live on my channel? I need four monitors. You oh, are. Yeah. I am. I, hey, Lucifer Almighty, 1,000 fine points. He's the first one here. You see, Tom, this is what you need to do. you got to set up some type of reward system for your viewers and incentivize them to be the first ones here. It's all about the people, Tom. It's about the people watching. It's not about you. It's not about the people you debate. It's about the little guy who's at home alone. Great debate, T-Jump. Too bad most people weren't understanding what you were trying to say. Really, Croc? Because I got it the first time when Tom told me. <laughs> Read like what you did, Tom. Okay. So it looks like everything's working. So I have not watched this video, guys. Uh, I know Cam Spires, the middle guy, wants to sink his teeth into this, right, Cam? With some of the quantum mechanics stuff. I've heard. Um, Wait and see. <laughs> yeah, I've heard basically most of uh, what T Jump uh, says on these topics. I've heard it many times before. I'm going to uh, give my take. Uh, I've not heard this before. Uh, I was out with my kids tonight, but I'm going to give my take on what the uh, average conservative fundamentalist type Christian will think about some of the things um, Michael Jones says, uh, inspiring philosophy, because I, I know them like the back of my hand. I know what they're thinking. And um, and then, Tom, you can jump in if anything you thought you could have improved on. Just raise, put up your hands, guys, and unmute yourself. And um, and let's go. And I'm going to play this uh, fast. So if you're um, a slow listener, you, you need to listen faster. Why there is a God is going to be Mike. So Mike, let me know when you're ready. I'll start the timer for you. All right, I'm going to share my screen. So let me get that set up here. Yeah, absolutely. Take your time. You and James coordinate that. And then once you feel like you're ready, I will get everything going. And again, I will reiterate while we're working on that, please tag Modern Day Debate in the side chat if you have. A oh, uh, yeah. Uh, the topic was, uh, does God exist? Question. Are you ready, James, Mike? Let me, let me know when you're ready. I can see the presentation. Hey, Daddy. Yeah. You might want to recapture the screen for the sake of the audience. No, it's actually, it's actually look this bad, almost this bad on the actual video. So it's not my problem. It's, yeah, but it, it looks like you're only capturing part of it, though. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> okay, let me recapture it. But it's still going to be, a li I can make it a little bit better, but not much. All right. Well, I'm happy to have this conversation today because I've been turned down multiple times to debate the topic. James knows from one back in the fall. Um, the debate topic tonight is, does God exist? Now, as a classical apologist, I'll be arguing a theistic or deistic worldview is more probable given the evidence. So I don't claim I can prove God exists. No, you've got to take that. For Christian theism tonight. I'll be arguing for basic theism or deism. And I'll present three arguments that God exists. My aim is to show that deism or theism is the best explanation given the available data. So the first argument I'll present is the digital physics argument. Okay. Um, in several of my videos, I've presented various lines of evidence. Space time is emergent and not fundamental. So I'll go over some of that. In the hunt to rectify quantum mechanics with relativity, physicists discovered something known as the holographic principle, a theory which suggests the entire three-dimensional universe can be seen as two-dimensional information. So in other words, the whole three-dimensional universe, the particles that make up reality, would emerge from underlying information in quantum field theory. Okay, I can tell you right now that the typical average Christian is going to say, what in the heck are you talking about, inspiring philosophy? This is ridiculous. 
you're using holograms to prove God. This is crazy. In 2017, a peer-reviewed study published observable evidence of the holographic principle. From looking at irregularities in the background radiation, their team found that simple equations of quantum field theory uh, could explain almost all the cosmological observations, is marginally better fit than the standard model, and it can potentially explain apparent anomalies. I won't go into that that much right now. Um, the emergent features of space-time can be seen elsewhere. A study from later that year argued quantum entanglement is an inevitable feature of reality. Quote, directly, they say, we show that any theory with a classical limit must contain entangled states, thus establishing entanglement as an inevitable feature of any theory superseding, superseding classical theory. Uh, Cam, why is he talking about entanglement, entanglement here? What does this have to do with God? Broadly, in his digital ph physics argument, it seems to fit in as a type of evidence that the universe is a simulation, which then leads into his argument that if it's a simulation, that it either has to be on a computer or in a mind, and if it's in a computer, it also has to be in a mind and therefore God. It's like, that's a summary. Like, I'm not saying that's exactly what he says, but he puts up a slide later in the debate um, at the end of his digital physics argument that summarizes it. Tom or Cam, does he define what God is at any point in this? He says that the mind that we can conclude from the digital physics argument is what we call God. And he doesn't define it any further. Wow. So this God, as long as this God can put something into uh, a simulation, this God could could be evil, right? I mean, but how what we view as evil, this God could be evil, according to. Well, I think his argument is not that it's a god that, say, for example, created a physical world and then runs a physical simulation within that world that simulates our universe. His argument is that the universe itself is being simulated in a mind. I think these are only his introductory arguments. He has more arguments to lead to the Christian God, but these are just the first ones he goes to to get to a mind as the source of the universe. So the universe is playing out uh, basically a reality inside the mind of a deity is what is that it? I think that's kind of what it's like. Yeah. And he's an idealist. So that matches up. Okay. So when we touch things, feel things, smell things, it's not really real. It's all just things that we're sensing within the mind of a deity. Okay. Thus, the information between particles does not seem to be affected by space as it can be transferred instantly, implying space is not fundamental for the underlying world of quantum mechanics, but an emergent phenomenon of the classical world that would only exist after measurement. Now, I can argue the emergent nature, uh, the emergent nature of matter and space-time from numerous areas, be it quantum mechanics, holographic, print, holographic principle, uh, Brian Whitworth's features of virtual reality uh, versus an objective reality, or in many other ways. But the idea of space-time as emergent is not, and not fundamental is accepted by more and more physicists every day. Uh, physicist uh, Haiyan Sook Yang says, emergent space-time is the new fundamental paradigm for quantum gravity. Uh, thus, the most up-to-date evidence suggests all of what we experience, space, time, matter, all seem to be emergent constructs of the class of the classical world, uh, not fundamental aspects of reality. But then the question becomes, what does space time emerge from? Well, essentially, the classical world emerges from the underlying information or the universal wave function of the quantum realm. However, interestingly enough, the same underlying features have been seen to parallel conscious thought processes. In 2009, physicist Diedrich Ertz took this one step further and published a paper noting that our cognitive processes can, quote, be readily modeled using the mathematical formulism of quantum mechanics. I'm okay, what does this have to do with a god ag again? Is this just basically saying... <laughs> I'm trying to... I I'm going to pound this home every single time. What does this have to do with a god? The goofy math stuff we see in quantum physics can also be explained by goofy math stuff we see when trying to model the mind. Ah, therefore, it must be a mind. Yeah, that's the thing, is that it seems to be like some type of argument from analogy here, which is pretty shaky. Um, he's saying, like, because the same mathematics can represent um, emergent, well, like, effectively, uh, like, quantum mechanics, and the same mathematics can model brain processes, therefore, they're somehow linked. Linked in a way that it's a that there's a, a greater mind bigger than all the seven billion minds in, on this planet. Is that what he's saying? There has to be some all encompassing well, mind. Well, so here he's talking about like the the picture of a what's called a universal wave function. Um, it's this idea that like if we take the representation of states within quantum mechanics series like so okay let's dumb it down 
you know how in uh, normal physics you have particles and they have position and then they have like momentum or like a velocity. Yeah, like the mass? electron going around the nucleus of an atom, like a the, no, the so Earth goes around the sun. More simple than that, <laughs> like a piece of dirt flying through space, for example. Okay. Um, so something really simple. Well, we would represent that using uh, a state of like three position variables effectively and then like a, a a magnitude of velocity and then a direction of the velocity and that would be what we use to represent the state well in quantum mechanics there's like a different state representation and if you like scale up quantum mechanics to be answering questions about the whole universe itself, not just questions about little bits of like uh, detection apparatus in a, in a laboratory, but you instead scale it up to be asking a question about what is the universe as a whole, then you get this thing called a universal wave function, which is a state representation of the universe as a whole. And he's saying that the structure of this thing looks a lot like the structure of a brain mathematically. That's what he seems to be saying to me. And so therefore there's some type of inference that the whole universe is like a mind or a brain. Um, that's the argument that I think he's making, but it, I don't think he's making it well, but yeah. Hmm. But he isn't necessarily arguing for just one mind here. He's just arguing for that mind or consciousness is fundamental. He would have further arguments to try and indicate one particular mind that he hasn't presented here. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how, how tight this analogy is. Like, my buttocks are round. A basketball is round. Is my buttocks like a basketball? <laughs> it's like... I, I imagine so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we could make it work, Doug. <laughs> in other words, our inner mental world of thoughts, quality, and emotions can be modeled in terms of Hilbert space and quantum processes, the same processes that give rise to space, time, and matter. So space, time, and matter are emergent from the quantum wave function in Hilbert space, and the inner world of consciousness and mind can be modeled via quantum processes in the study of quantum cognition. So this would suggest the evidence implies emergent space time would be indistinguishable from the same properties of a mind. So the simplest explanation is the universe is just emergent from a mind. If what the universe emerges from resembles a mind, it is far more parsimonious to accept it is in fact. The simplest explanation is that the universe is emergent from a mind. How is that more simple than just it exists? Yeah, I also think it neglects to consider the question from the other the other direction. Like if it is the case that what the universe is, is from what we can tell, at least, is this infinite dimensional Hilbert space uh, operating according to the Schrodinger equation, then it shouldn't be surprising to us that when we look at like modeling a particular subsystem, such as a brain <laughs> or a mind that we can use the same physical processes to model that subsystem because really we're talking about physical things in both cases. Um, so I don't see how the implication flows in the direction that he's thinking that it should. Um, if anything, I would have thought the fact that we can find that mental processes can be modeled using quantum mechanics would simply be further indication that quantum field theory or quantum mechanics is like the correct mathematical description of our physical world. Yeah, I, I'm putting myself in the mind of the typical Christians that I talk to, and they're thinking, why in the heck are you talking about this stuff, Michael? Like, what are you doing here? Why don't you just talk about the Kalam? Why don't you talk about fine tuning? Why don't you keep it simple? And, um, does he, uh, I guess we'll find out, but does he bring up those arguments later or no? No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Really? Whoa. Well, he said he watched like all my debates, so I can imagine he didn't because he knows that I have pretty good responses to those. You think that's why he did, didn't bring them up? Or do you think he actually just doesn't think they're powerful? Well, I, I know he's brought them up in his other videos. Really? Okay. Interesting. Like, if I was to summarize, like, we're going to see it coming on further, but if I was to summarize the broad argument that Michael makes, it's that um, there is something fundamental about m the mind or mental, like, there's something fundamentally mental about the world. 
And I think that he's cho- not only is he choosing this because he's an idealist and that's actually what he thinks. And he thinks that there's powerful arguments in the, that direction for God. But he also, I think, is doing it because um, it subverts a what well, it at least seems to subvert an important part of uh, Tom's argument, which appeals to naturalistic pantheism, which yeah. isn't mental. Yeah. Um, You're right, Cam. Like, Tom, when you make your arguments, it basically naturalistic pantheism has everything uh, traditional theism has, except for the mind. And that's exactly where he went here, right? So, Yep. Okay. That's why he did it. And that's why Christians probably don't like what he did. But uh, I think Michael thought he had to do it that way in order to win, in quotes, this debate. Fact. This is also backed by the recent work of astrophysicist Franco Vaza and neurosurgeon Alberto Felitti, who wrote an article, and uh, Vaza has written papers on this as well, on the similarities between neural networks and the cosmic web of galaxies. Uh, there they. Sh- this sounds like to me like uh, those numerology type people. You know, I see numbers in the Old Testament that proves God, and I see the, the what well, you know those uh, the Fibonacci things. Is is this what he believes? Fibonacci no. sequences? No, I, I mean, I, I think that this is like, these structures look similar in some type of analyzable way. Therefore, they must be the same. It, to me, it kind of reminds me a little bit, and this is a bit tongue-in-cheek, of the people who are like, ah, oh, consciousness is mysterious and quantum mechanics is mysterious, so therefore quantum mechanics must have something to do with consciousness show the properties of neural networks in the brain are similar to the cosmic web of galaxies, something we would expect if the universe is emerging from a mind. So here's a formal representation of the digital physics argument. Uh, to save time, I, I won't go into it here, but I think I've presented enough evidence to back up the case. That you know- okay, uh, I know it's cut off. Let me read it. Simulations can only exist in a computer or mind. The universe is... I don't know if I grant premise one right off the bat, but anyhow. The universe is a simulation. I don't grant that. Uh, simulation on a computer still must be simulated in a mind. No. Okay, forget it. I don't agree with that. Well, this is what I was saying earlier on, is that I don't really... Oh, actually, I didn't mention it here, but I mentioned it in the comments on the YouTube channel. Um, I don't really think that he makes a successful defense or even really attempts to explicitly justify premise one, two, or three. Right, I agree. I would immediately reject one as just an assumption. Uh, black and white fallacy. Yeah. And uh, P2 even though he makes an argument for emergent space-time and he makes an argument for the universal wave function of the universe having a similar structure to to mind processes, he doesn't make an argument for the universe being simulation. Um, And P3, I have no idea how he argues for P3. (laughs) P2 would just be an argument from analogy. What is the third one? I can't read it. Uh, Simulation Uh, on a computer still must be simulated in a mind. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. That's the that's the way he de- denies the the disjunction, like the second part of the disjunction in premise one. It seems like the argument God could not have been created. So it's like arguing that the universe must have a cause, but God what doesn't have a cause because he's uncreated. So he's kind of making the same kind of argument here, saying that if it was simulated in a computer, well, the computer must have been caused by a mind. And, and the computer can't be fundamental, even though the mind can, for arbitrary reasons. Yeah, I, I actually want to write this out properly as a logical argument, because I'm not totally sure yet that it's even logically valid. Like, that its structure, like the form of the argument is even valid. But anyway. It's emerging from the mind. The second argument I'd like to present is something called the cosmic conscious argument. It was named for Eugene Wigner's work. Uh, premise one, contingent minds either have personal explanations or natural explanations. Now, this is not too controversial. Almost all theories of mind either hold to reductionist type views or believe consciousness is irreducible as it is and would have to come from a fundamental source. Uh, premise two, quantum mechanics and other fields of science imply the natural universe is emerging from information processing and consciousness. This is the most controversial premise. Essentially, numerous experiments in quantum mechanics imply conscious, consciousness plays an important role in wave function collapse and the appearance of material reality. Uh, we can get into more of this during the discussion section. I'm more than happy to, but essentially experiments such as interaction free experiments, late choice quantum eraser experiments, the violation of the leg and inequality, and the confirmation of the coach inspector theorem a lead to the inference consciousness would cause collapse. Now, this is a philosophical inference. Let me point that out. Now, to preempt the objection, interaction and decoherence alone is not enough to explain wave function collapse. Uh, so, for example, one book here notes that, that does decoherence solve the measurement problem? Clearly not. What decoherence tells us is that certain objects are classical when they are observed. 
But what is an observation? At some stage, we have to apply this, the usual probability rules of quantum theory. Maximilian Schlawhauser says in his extensive paper on decoherence, that decoherence arises from a direct application of the quantum mechanical formulism. I, I guarantee you he's lost 95% of the people listening. Like, what is he doing? Does he want people to understand what he's saying? <laughs> like, I don't understand. Like, for me, Well, to contradict you a little bit, Doug, I was in the live chat and people were like, yay, Michael, like, yay, IP. <laughs> they were well, really rooting for him. And they were saying that what he was saying was convincing. Well, yeah, but they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I shouldn't say they're lying, but they're, you know how it is. You're rooting for your team, right? And, uh, but I tell you, you get, you delve deep into the heart and soul of these people watching this and they're, they're probably thinking, what the heck is he talking about? In fact, I, I came late and at the end of the conversation, uh, I think someone asked the question, can you dumb this down like I'm a six-year-old or nine-year-old or whatever and, and tell me what you guys really think. Like, and if one guy is brave enough to ask that type of question, you know there's many more who just not understanding what's going on here. I think like from a strategic point of view, if your goal is to build up the confidence of Christians listening, you don't go here. You do not provide this type of defense. Because this is not something people can use. This is not something that people can bite onto. To a description of the interaction of a physical system with an environment. By itself, decoherence is therefore neither an interpretation nor a modification of quantum mechanics. And thus, as John von Neumann, Henry Stapp, uh, Fred Kuttner, Bruce Rosenblum, Bernard Hashford, Richard Kahn Henry, Stephen Barr, Ian Squires, etc., etc., all argue this philosophically leads to the conclusion consciousness ultimately causes collapse in the long string of things. So what follow the appearance of, of material reality is emerging from consciousness, not the other way around. So conclusion one, the natural universe cannot be the explanation of contingent minds since material reality emerges from consciousness. Does he define mind? Mm, not that I'm aware of. I don't think so. Because he's throwing the word mind out like it's candy, but like, do dogs have minds? Do worms have minds? Like, what is a mind? It's... And he's using the word minds in every premise here. Or no, not the second one. My goodness. This is nuts. Consciousness, premise three. The explanation of uh, conscious minds is personal. Uh, this personal source is what we call God. Conclusion, therefore God exists. So unless Tom can demonstrate consciousness is emerging from the brain, and trust me, I am more than willing to go over numerous pieces of data and studies in neuroscience. I just, got, I just finished reading John Eccles' book. So, um, so unless he can show that consciousness is emerging from the brain, the most likely explanation is consciousness is irreducible and thus contingent minds like all of us would most likely not prove but most likely be contingent on a larger consciousness that controls reality and brings other contingent minds into existence who we call god uh, third okay so there he just defined god as um someone who controls consciousness brings it into reality or something and is bigger uh, bigger type of consciousness and that's god finally i present the same line of reasoning via basic philosophy through the introspective argument uh, premise one the mind exists this one's not too controversial as descartes said i think therefore i am Premise two, the properties of the mind are not that which matter can have. So, so far there has been no evidence or a plausible theory. So again, here he's, the premise one, the mind exists. What's the mind? Right, I just generalize and uh, agree that just consciousness is what he's referring to. <laughs> but even then, like, what's consciousness? How is he defining that? Like, the, these are, these are such, um, what's the word, wishy-washy type terms, like, it's like we use it in everyday language, consciousness, but we really don't even know what that is. Really? Do we? Do we know what consciousness is? <laughs> right, which is why a second premise is completely unsupported because you can't say it cannot be this because you to be able to say it cannot be this, you already have to know what it is. Yeah, I, I, think, I think a lot of this boils down to this concept of the mind is that humans are special. We're really special. And... And there has to be a, even a more special God out there to make us special and feel special. Because when I ask that question, like, does, do snails have minds? Um, then you really get into, well, maybe we're just like a snail, except, you know, with a lot more computing power in our synapses. Have you gone past the cosmic conscious argument yet? I don't think so. That is the one that you're previously on. 
Oh, so you're saying we did go past it? <laughs> well, I, I'm more meaning like, have you finished discussing it? Oh, um, yeah, I think you were here for that. I basically said we don't even know what a mind is or consciousness. So, well, I think I think the biggest objection there is that while he cites a bunch of um, people who hold to the wave function collapse caused by consciousness interpretation of the measurement problem or solution to the measurement problem. Um, he doesn't really explore any of the counter arguments against that. And he doesn't really give an assessment or a fair assessment of the field of philosophy of physics and well, physics broadly about whether or not consciousness plays an important or distinguished physical role in the collapse of the wave function. And I think that Tom helped point out this later on in the debate that, um, there doesn't seem to be any type of consensus that consciousness plays a distinguished physical role in the collapse of the wave function. In fact, it more goes the opposite way that people tend to go with um, uh, either operationalist uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics, such as the Copenhagen, or they go with uh, physical um, ontological views of the wave function, such as the Everett interpretation, or they go with modified versions of quantum mechanics, such as uh, the Bohmian mechanics or GRW, N none of which uh, have this consciousness playing an important role so what you're in saying, the collapse Cam, of the wave function. What you're saying, Cam, is what uh, Michael is saying, IP is saying, is not a consensus view. That's right. Not only is it a consent, not a consensus view, it's actually a very minority view. In, in uh, particular, there was a conference on Foundations of Quantum Mechanics in 2011, where they did a survey, like an informal poll of around 33 uh, professionals working in foundations of QM and only three out of those 33 respondents said that consciousness plays any um, special role in co the collapse process. And so like, obviously that doesn't mean that it's wrong. Like the, the argument here isn't like uh, this is an unpopular view, therefore it's wrong. It's just, he needs to do a lot more to establish this premise than just appealing to some select few physicists in the field or philosophers of physics in the field who hold the view because if that if that was all you need to do then i could just like appeal to david albert and appeal to sean carroll and david wallace or leonard suskind or like you know i could just appeal to people too and we would be on an equal footing and the the whole discussion is just um you know stalled or stalemated i think it was eugenie scott who said that uh you can find a paper written by a scientist to support anything, but that's not really what matters. It's the consensus. The After fighting through all of the different possibilities and coming to a consensus in the field, that's what really matters. Yeah, and it's even worse because in this particular case, this is not something that uh, physicists generally consider experimental evidence as bearing any particular uh, like falsification or verification style um conclusion on what i mean by that is it's generally the realm of philosophy where this is being discussed and the different answers to the question of the measurement problem are being evaluated for their um their adherence to important principles and philosophy of science not so much like you do an experiment and it proves one interpretation right or wrong um and so it's even worse than like you know many other disputes in science where we can have an expectation that uh f future evidence will rule in favor of one particular view over another it actually looks as though this is one of those kind of things that science like direct evidence may not actually be able to bear on the question it might be a matter of like honing and sharpening our understanding of how to interpret and understand science do you think do you think Michael defines mind and consciousness the same way a lot of uh, Christians define morality as having, it has to have, 
it has to be about this God in an ultimate sense outside of all humans. Is he defining mind meaning that it has to be immaterial? Well, no, not necessarily, because he, he granted, like, the natural, supernatural distinction isn't very meaningful in that I presented an alternative interpretation of the emergent space-time that is purely physical from Neymar Carney Hamad, and he said that that wasn't necessarily incompatible with his viewpoint. So well, he may not be arguing that. Although one of his arguments does rely on the usage of natural um, in its premises. So he must think the distinction is somehow relevant because, yeah, because he uses it in his argument. Well, okay, pretend you're Mike. Uh, here's my question. True or false? A mind can exist without a god. What would he say? Probably false. Yeah, I think he'd say false I think, too. I think it would depend on whether or not he thought you were asking the question, is it logically possible versus like... Is it? Yeah, is actual? it logically possible <laughs> or something? I think yeah, I think you'd probably say yes to that, but maybe yeah. I'm wrong. Yeah, you might I think. You uh, might I think grant the pure possibility of it, but he yeah. probably would say it's far less likely. Kind of like he did at the end with the square circle question. So I think that he broadly holds to a view that it 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 must be the case that mind ends up being what I would call ontologically fundamental that instead of uh, us being able to, um, to, to look at our explanations of conscious phenomena and sort of like dig down and understand how like this phenomena is built up from uh, processes and uh, objects and things like this and our ontology, I think that he thinks that ultimately there's something mental at the bottom. Um, is... Uh, this is inside baseball. Probably just me and Cam will understand this. But is Mike basically nomad, Cam? Oh, um, no, I don't want to say that because later on I'm going to call him uh, <laughs> Michael D. Patropa Jones. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to say that. No, man. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's keep going. This John Steer even has to admit, how does a mental reality, a world of consciousness, intentionality, and other mental phenomena fit into a world consisting entirely of physical particles and fields of force? Colin McGuinn admits, the problem with materialism is that it tries to construct the mind out of properties that refuse to add up to mentality. There is simply no evidence consciousness can emerge from matter. All yeah, to me, uh, both these quotes are um, quotes of ignorance. It's like arguments from ignorance. Uh, how can it be? The problem with materialism is it tries to construct the mind out of properties that refuse to add up to mentality. Like these are just, I can't figure this out. There must be something else. Naturalism can't explain it, therefore it must be some new category of thing. Yeah. All neuroscience can show at best is correlation, not causation. And unfortunately, all materialists then confuse this. However, the properties of matter we experience can easily be reduced to mind, since all of what we experience is a mental world of qualia, sounds, etc. None of these are, are physical, they are mental phenomena. We essentially experience a mental reality, so there's no reason to posit a separate material world beyond our mental experiences. As Keith Ward says, any physicist will say that brains are mostly empty space in which molecules, atoms, electrons, quarks, and other strange particles buzz around in complicated ways. It seems as though physical objects, when not being observed, have no colors, and no sounds, smells, or tastes either. Either Sounds, like colors, are not physical events. Neither are smells, tastes, or sensations. Things do not smell like, taste like, or feel like anything when nobody is smelling, tasting, or feeling them. The physical world seems it's totally vacuous. No colors, sounds, smells, tastes, or sensations. What on earth is left? This idea can also be explained via David Hume's bundle theory, which we can get into later. Thus, our first conclusion is mind is not reducible to matter. Uh, okay, the mind exists. The properties of the mind are not that which matter can have. Ugh. Okay, well, I don't know what a mind is, according to him. And the properties of mind are not that which matter can have. Uh, how do you know that? Mind is not reducible this, to matter. How do you know uh, that? This is just all terrible, isn't it not? Well, also, I think that he effectively just undermined a whole bunch of things that he claimed in his first argument. Because if you think about it, he's saying that, uh, well, at least it seemed like he was saying in the first argument that uh, the universal wave function has within it mental people or like mental objects like humans that have mental processes that are going on and this consciousness going on there. Right. I don't think so. I think he, I was thinking he was using that as a descriptive thing and saying that we can describe this fundamental nature of reality using the wave function, but it isn't the physical properties of the wave function that have the mind. It's the wave function is a product of the mind. Yeah, that might have been what he was saying. 
I, I that didn't I did I didn't get that clearly, but anyway, in this he's saying well, well first of all the argument's not very good because it appeals to whether or not the properties of the mind uh, could could be from uh, could be properties that matter has, but he already seems to have conceded some type of comparative ontological point of view where he's not just appealing to matter alone quantum field theory for example which is the which is the prominent theory of in physics that he appealed to in his first argument that doesn't have matter as it's like fundamental thing that would need to be producing minds instead it has fields um so in this argument he would need to be saying for example the mind exists the properties of mind are not that which quantum field theory can have and then therefore mind is not reducible to quantum field theory and substance dualism false and then the continuation of the argument i'm seeing this as just d definitions like uh premise one he says the mind exists that could be very simply um what a lot of christians say objective morality exists premise two uh the properties of the mind are not that which so only only objective morality can come from a god objective morality can only come from a god therefore um there is a god so like uh objective moral values and duties can't exist without a god objective moral values and duties exist therefore there's a god yeah except he reversed them so i basically think that what he mike is doing here is he's defining the word mind necessarily to entail that which matter cannot have that the mind cannot be made of matter. So he's basically, premise one really says, the mind which can only exist outside of matter or cannot, um, cannot be a property of matter is premise one. And therefore the conclusion is, mind is not reducible to matter. It's basically a tautology. If he's defining mind the way I think he is. But anyhow. Um, premise three, uh, substance dualism is false. I believe Tom agrees with me on this, but you can argue it be a Spinoza's interaction problem. If there are two substances, they have to interact via shared property, where they share properties, they're just different, um, just different aspects of one substance. So conclusion, all is mind. If all is mind is correlated with the previous two arguments that I gave, that there is a, a larger governing mind that brings us contingent minds into existence to experience and operating reality. So if Tom thinks God probably does not exist or there's no reason to believe in God, he must tear down these arguments and offer a more probable explanation, not just another possible explanation, but something more probable and parsimonious. Given what I've seen in this past debate, I will contest this cannot be done. And the best explanation, the most probable and parsimonious, is a theistic worldview. And with that, I'll yield back the rest of my time. You bet. Well, thanks so much. Okay, so at this point, Tom, were you expecting this from him? Uh, what were your think thinking in your mind? Did well, I was just writing down his arguments and pre-writing down my rebuttals to them. Okay, so you base what you had planned for this debate, was it now completely switched and changed and different? I didn't really have anything like pre-planned. Oh, you're sort of like me when I'm interviewing Christians. <laughs> it's like, let it flow. Okay. Mike Jones, totally appreciate it, man. And with that, we will jump back into the opening statement. So handing back over to Shannon. So yeah, uh, if you have to leave, Cam, just leave your thing up. Sorry, Shannon, I have it. I jumped back in, but <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Shannon. Little guy, you're all right. All right, thanks, Mike. So, Tom, just let me know when you are ready. I'm just going to reset the timer, and you will have 12 minutes. And Mike was pretty precise. He stopped just just shy, just shy of 10 minutes for Mike. So, let me know when you're ready. I'll start. Thanks, the timer Craig. So start speaking. Appreciate it. All right, um, I'm an atheist. I define atheism as a positive position. There are no reasons, evidence, or argument that indicate the existence of a god. If there is such a reason, then I will stop being an atheist. How can we know there is no evidence indicative of a god? Well, if you have a box, and you said there is a rabbit in the box, and your evidence for this is that the box weighs two pounds. The fact that the box weighs two pounds is not evidence of a rabbit because it can be equally explained by a lizard or coffee mug or weight or Legos, etc. The fact that this evidence works equally well for numerous other options means it is not evidence of a rabbit. The same thing applies to evidence of a god. If it works equally well for all non god alternatives, then it is not evidence of a god. Some alternative theism would include theism, pantheism, naturalism, pantheism, transtheism, polytheism, pastafarianism, panpsychism, etc. For the sake of time, I'll only defend one of these naturalist and pantheisms to just necessary eternal power of nature with no mind. For more information, you can see. Okay, so at this point, you've, you're basically with your same intro as, as usual. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy page on pantheism and just search naturalistic pantheism. Because pantheism lacks consciousness or personhood, if any argument works equally well for pantheism as it does for theism, then that argument is not evidence of a god, as theists define it. Some theists argue that the arguments individually don't indicate a god, but they argue collectively when you add them together, they do abductively work as evidence. This is false for the exact same reason. All the arguments individually and collectively work equally for the alternatives like pantheism as they do for theism. So all arguments together are like the two pounds and are not evidence of a god. For example, the cosmological argument the universe could have been created by necessary pantheism. The teleological argument there could be an See, I'm curious why you went this way, Tom, because. The one thing you natural uh, naturalistic pantheism does not have is a mind, 
and his whole argument is about mines. But you kept with this. Well, I think that this was Tom just reading his opening statement. Right. But did so you I wrote, have, uh, what? At this point, did you think, oh, I can't read this opening statement anymore? Well, no, because false arguments also indicate mutually exclusive uh, alternatives, like the principle of explosion from false and anything follows. So his arguments are just false. So I can just say, yeah, these work equally as well for pantheism because they're false. Okay, I see what you're saying. But once you get into the nitty gritty of it, then it's going to, um, well, we'll see what you did. Discovered super law grounded in nature, pantheism, the interconnection of the conditions explain the fine tuning. Moral argument there could be an undiscovered law of nature that's grounded in pantheism. The transcendental argument there could be an undiscovered law of nature grounded in math and logic in the nature of pantheism. All of these arguments individually and collectively work for pantheism just as well or better than they do for theism. And so even if you add all other arguments together, you still get the same result. The reason this is the case is that all theist arguments are false, because no known form of knowledge can justify stopping points for truth, such as metaphysical claims, absolute truths, or similar such claims. A stopping point for truth is something that, by definition, there is nothing beyond it, like saying God is by definition not created. Therefore, all arguments and evidence for God will all necessarily work for any alternative because of the principle of explosion. From falsehood, anything follows. Uh, anything science can't answer, theology also can't answer. For example, take the position of metaphysical naturalism, which is the position that the nature is all that is, is absolute. Yeah. So I think that, like, it might be worthwhile to explain to the audience what the principle of explosion is. Um, yeah, e effectively, like, the, the way it works is that there's this particular rule in, um, in logic where it's called uh, disjunctive introduction. And so say if you have a premise P, at any point in time, you are completely warranted logically to introduce another premise in disjunction with it. So you can go P or Q. So an example would be um, Doug is gay. <laughs> So that's like a premise that we have, and we're saying that it's <laughs> we we have that in our proof. We have Doug is Did gay. Did you see in me drifting <laughs> off? And you you had to say something to get me back focusing. <laughs> and then in disjunction, we have that introduced another premise, um, or unicorns exist. And in logic, you're allowed to do that any time that you have a premise and a proof, and the because of the fact that with the disjunction uh either one or the other or both have to be true it means that if you have false in the first part of the disjunction the other thing follows so you can introduce any premise that you want in combination with a false premise and you can get a logically valid argument that implies anything is true. And so that's called the principle of explosion. Is that is that correct, Tom? Yeah, that's correct. So you could do, say something like the square root of a pork chop, therefore God, or something. Just to yeah. introduce something false and then have a follow-up that is the, your preferred conclusion. But the same thing works for the opposite, saying the square root of a pork chop, therefore God, does not exist. And so, so I... So I think what Tom's saying in the in the opening, which I don't really think is that clear um, to most people, um, but he's saying that any of these premises in uh, in Michael's arguments, if he wants to affirm them, but they're actually false, then you can then use those premises to to show that uh, naturalistic pantheism is true. No, by, natural. by the principle of explosion. Even given all of the evidence of the natural world that does not show there is no supernatural, because there could always be a supernatural realm out there that we just haven't discovered yet. The same thing applies to claims of a god, like there is only one god. Even if we had as much evidence for a god as we do for the natural world, that would not show the god was not created by another greater god for the exact same reason. There could always be another greater god out there that we just haven't discovered yet. This also applies to all metaphysical properties, like all-powerful god, all-knowing god, all-loving, eternal, necessary, define a sanity, pure actuality, etc. There can always be another god out there that we just haven't discovered yet, which is more powerful, more knowledgeable, more good, etc which means that no form of human knowledge can justify those properties of anything. So if you just define God as not created or any of those other properties, it's simply an admission you are making an unsupported metaphysical claim, and I can just define the alternative like pantheism as uncreated, all-powerful, all-good, perfectly simple, etc. So just defining your explanation as having these metaphysical properties works for everything and is evidence of nothing. The same problems that prevent scientific conclusions like metaphysical naturalism from being... Yeah, the, the main difference, I agree with what you just said there, Tom, but the main difference between naturalistic pantheism and, uh, let's say, Christianity is... They got 2,000 years of tradition on their side, Tom. What do you have? You have this just made-up 
rhetoric used to battle Christians and theists in general, but they got this rich, they got holy texts. Where's your holy text, Tom? And then, oh, oh, didn't you know, Doug? I wrote it down. I'm just going to have to wait the 2,000 years for it to mature and age a little bit. It'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> your your naturalistic pantheism is like a fine wine. It just needs to be... Uh, All you need to do aged. is fire it out in a rocket past a black hole and get it to orbit back around to us. It'll age it sufficiently. <laughs> but Tom, what I just said, I think, is exactly the pushback that, that I think you get. Um, I remember with Luke Barnes... It's like he said something to that effect, like, well, what are you talking about? What, I, I would have to sink my teeth in. I need to read what you're actually believing and espousing. And it's like he wanted some some holy text in order to bash your beliefs down. <laughs> you know, there's only like one aspect of that that I find like a little bit valid, but it's actually not. Um, and it's that there is a feeling about your proposed alternate explanations tom that they aren't well defined and so it there there is like an openness to a criticism okay well this thing that you're positing like you're not giving any explanation as to how um you take this precise theory and then give an explanation or an expectation about how you would actually observe these data this data but the thing is is that um because it's like this infinite it could be this infinite series of ad hoc explanations it doesn't really need to do that anyway so like in the in the worst case scenario you can just like like join not giving with the claims such that you've got this like long series of ad hoc uh things tacked onto one another but even in like the more uh, like simpler case um the problem is their theory also doesn't have this explanatory property either so it's not like you're doing anything different than they are and like when you ask them to for example explain how it is that from the properties of god you get actual particular or like expectations about what you'll observe in the world or things like this they can't do it like because or, god's not a physical theory right or whatever answer they come up with and whatever answer they're satisfied with i can just hijack that answer and say well my theory can do that too yeah exactly but they find that to be that's the move that they find disingenuous but i think that it's valuable because it's showing uh that because really like it's epistemic rhetoric like you're not really playing a game of competing ontologies you're instead showing how epistemically these two things are in this we're in the same position as humans with respect to these two theories justified as stopping points for truth also prevent religious claims from being justified as stopping points for truth because these problems because of these problems anything science can't answer theology can't answer either but we can both make stuff up the problems outlined in the previous examples are the problem of induction and the problem of undetermination which is why even given all the evidence of the natural world it does not rule out the supernatural and equivalent evidence for god would not rule out there being another greater god yeah this is something christians just don't can't it does not compute tom like when you say that what they're doing is just making stuff up no they they we have evidence, Tom. Christians have evidence. It's called the Bible. And this is not just stuff made up like what you've done, Tom. You're just making things up. You're the one making things up. We're not. They, they, can't, they can't understand what you're saying, Tom. I, I, I tell you, they're not, it's not computing, not resonating with them. Induction and undetermination are only applied to empirical or a posteriori forms of evidence. However, there are equivalent problems with every known form of knowledge, which have the same effect, demonstrating no known form of knowledge can justify any stopping point for truth, such as metaphysical claims. A priori knowledge has the problem of the criterion, Agrippa's dilemma, the problem of the universals, the problem of easy knowledge, math has Gadol's completeness theorem, logic has Tarsus' fundability theorem, moral knowledge has the open question argument, and the fact value distinction. Boy, I can't, you guys talk so fast, I shouldn't really speed it up at all. <laughs> well, Tom, Tom speaks faster than Michael as well. Yeah. <laughs> But both, both of them. Was well, one of the ones that you said the Gödel's incompleteness theorems? Is that one of the ones within mathematics that you were saying illustrates a limit in knowledge? Right. Because uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem one is that uh, there are certain unresolvable statements, and given any any system of arithmetic, and the second one is that given a sufficiently complicated system of arithmetic, it can't be shown to be internally consistent without reference to an external kind of system. Right. You have to go like one higher in the logic, right? Oh, Joy, Joy, I'm not beating up on Tom with what I just said. I'm basically letting Tom know, and I think he already knows this, is that the 
average American Christian listening to Tom, they just it does not compute when he's making comments that, hey, we got this thing that we need to explain. You say God, I say naturalistic pantheism. We're both just making things up because we don't know. Th that type of rhetoric does not work with them. They just like it's no, I've experienced Jesus in my life. He's in my heart, don't you know? Like this is not this does not resonate with them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, is that, naturalistic that makes pantheism sense. in your heart, Tom? <laughs> yes, it is. I, I got the sensations from the universe. They give me visions. But that's just the introduction to my argument. The point of my argument that's supposed to be compel people is every answer they give or every reason they give to believe in God, I can show works equally as well for pantheism. That's what's supposed to convince people, yeah. not the statement that there can be this pantheism. Yeah, and, yeah, and I think that that's a lost on a lot of people because it's an epistemological point that you're making, not an ontological one. Yeah, yeah, and, I've received that criticism a couple of times from a lot of different people. Like the first time I heard you do this, Tom, with Christians or theists, is um, I was thinking, oh, you're just doing the outsider test for faith on philosophical arguments. That's all you're doing. And, you know, it's the same thing as a Mormon saying, I, uh, I prayed to God and he told me that the Book of Mormon was true. It's, it's the same thing as saying a Christian prays to God to help them understand the Gospels or whatever. You're, you're using the same thing, except applied to philosophical arguments like the Kalam, the moral argument, and so forth. Right. And supernatural sources, which it explicitly says on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Metaethics. So every known form of knowledge has these problems, and all these problems apply to both scientific and theological explanations. Therefore, if your explanation is or has a stopping point for truth, such as eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnibenevolent, the only divine society, pure actuality, or a brute fact, then it cannot be justified by any known form of knowledge. So any claim of something having such properties is nothing but a bald assertion, which can be demonstrated by showing the same assertions or arguments can work to support any of the alternatives, like pantheism. Now, I agree that there has to be some necessary thing to ground the existence of everything, but there is nothing further we can say about it. There is no reason, no argument, nor evidence that indicates a mind or a god. It can simply just be a form of naturalistic pantheism. The bigger problem is that metaphysical properties are de facto infinites. When you add them to an explanation, it allows you to do an infinite amount of ad hoc reasoning, allowing you to explain away any inconsistencies which you can entail in your ad hoc explanation and the infinite. I, he's actually listening to you, Tom. Like, I'm, I'm watching... I'm not watching you. I'm watching Michael. And I can tell he's, I think he's actually listening to you. <laughs> I mean, like, it's almost like it's the first time he's hearing you say this. Hmm. So this point that you made is the one that I was making earlier, right? That like, when you propose uh, like any type of metaphysical property, it's a de facto, it's, it's de facto like the same as like an infinite chain of ad hoc explanations. Exactly. Exactly like what you were saying earlier. The property to make it seem as if it has explanatory power, when really it has none because the same method can work for literally anything. This can be demonstrated by adding such properties to any of the alternatives to theism, which point out that they can do the exact same thing. For example, theists like to define their gods perfectly simple, define the deity, by redefining simplicity as the lack of limitation. The first thing to note is that this is the exact opposite of simplicity. When you're looking for a simple explanation for any given phenomenon, the simplest explanation is the one that is the most restricted and the most limited. The least restricted is the most complicated explanation. What caused that noise? Is it an all-powerful being with no limitations, or was it a mouse? Obviously, the mouse is simpler. So, simplicity is the most limited thing, not the least. That's new. I haven't heard you say that before. So I'm interested in this one. Like, there's two things that come to mind. One, how can, can you explain to me how it is that the presumption or like the, you know, the assertion of a metaphysical property is equivalent to like an infinite or from that it always follows there's like an infinite chain of or there could be an infinite chain of ad hoc explanations well you could add something like saying the theists use the argument that uh god may have some sufficient reason for allowing suffering well that could just work for literally anything literally any amount of suffering in any possible universe that same argument can be used to justify it so it has an infinite amount of applicability to just literally any argument the right. same thing applies to simplicity where they're saying that this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving being who is is somehow s the simplest explanation. I mean, if you're just going to start adding in these properties, these infinite properties, and just define it as define a deity, but we can just do the same thing and apply it to any other random properties we want. So that also has just infinite applicability. We can just apply anything you want and just call it define, define simplicity. Yeah, those ones make sense. But we is it do you hold to the to the idea that it applies that the same analysis applies for all metaphysical? like postulates or properties or whatever you would want to call them probably i don't know of any that don't so far okay at least one of the thing the properties of a theistic god are omnipotent eternal necessary omnibenevolent 
uh, omniscient, personal, and conscious. The properties of pantheism are omnipotent, eternal, necessary. So obviously, pantheism is simpler because it only contains three of theism's seven properties. Theists argue that these are not individual properties, they're all entailed in God's nature. And if you were allowed to add any arbitrary properties to your explanation, just assert they're all entailed in divine aseity of your position, we can do the same for any alternative. For example, we can add divine aseity to the flying spaghetti monster and say, the spaghetti is perfectly simple, and anything that is not spaghetti is the privation of spaghetti. Unless you can demonstrate your definition of simplicity corresponds to the fundamental nature of reality, which no form of human knowledge can do, then it's just your own ad hoc definition, which is no more supported than me simply defining the spaghetti monster as the simplest thing. Now, but Michael didn't define God at all yet, right? Other than uh, being the master consciousness of the universe or something like that. Well, this isn't, this isn't a rebuttal. This is my introduction. So it's just stating my position. Yeah, but I, I can tell that Michael's in his mind right now. He's probably thinking all this is irrelevant to what I said, but that's the I guess the downside of being second in a debate, right? Because it might be totally irrelevant to what the first guy's opening statement was. <laughs> Another example right. of the argument, and that even more relevant that he's taking the po the positive position and you're taking the negative position. God may have sufficient reason to allow suffering. That could literally be used to justify any universe with any amount of suffering. By adding the metaphysical properties to an explanation, you can explain away any criticism exactly like theists do in their, for their God. The flying spaghetti monster may have some sufficient reason for raising Jesus from the dead, like if it produced more spaghetti in the future. We can also we can add the property of supernatural, spaceless, and timeless to the flying spaghetti monster and make it non-physical, magical, spaceless, timeless spaghetti, which is entailed in its nature, just like theists do with the property of consciousness. Top-down approaches to reality are wrong. Starting with metaphysical absolutes and trying to build down to understand reality is fundamentally a flawed methodology, as there is no known form of knowledge that can justify such properties, so they give us no way to show an explanation is anything more than just one. So this is the point where he got confused and he thought that you were saying that top-down causation is invalid, and you can see he's going off to, like, Google something to find his reference about top-down causation. <laughs> Yeah, he, it, but it was kind of hard to understand what you said, so I think it's kind of fair, but yeah. Yeah, I, you're talking about top-down epistemology, right? How do you f figure out what we know? And when you Right, well, I'm specifically referring to metaphysical claims about the fundamental nature of reality when I say top-down. He's interpreting it as a different kind of top-down, yeah. more of a methodological kind of top-down. But I know exactly Well, no, I think you... I think he's talking, I think he's thinking about it in terms of um, like top down causal process, where, for example, something that might be considered like a higher level emergent phenomena has the ability to cause things uh, that like, or is like an identifiable cause for lower level things. But anyway. Right, and I wouldn't reject that because we can know emergent things like the sun can cause other things to happen, like the bending of gravity and the warming up of the planets and things. One of the infinitely many imaginary alternatives, which is why science does the opposite and starts with what is demonstrable and builds up and says nothing about the absolutes and the fundamental nature of reality. It's always tentative and provisional. Any claim about the final layer of reality is unsupported. We start from somewhere in the... And this is exactly why Christians are Christians or theists are theists, a lot of them. It's because of what you, exactly what you just said that science is provisional and tentative. They don't like that. That is not comforting. Are you talking about uncertainty, Tom? Because I don't want any part of that. I want to know that my God is real and that I have eternal life. This is how they think. And so this is just like, oh, don't, don't, they're, they're not going to like you, Tom. <laughs> but you already know that. I like you, Tom. Cam, I think, does too. In the middle and peel back layers one at a time with no end in sight in any direction so we can say nothing about what the final layer is going to be like as a final oh yeah see that that type of language we can't say anything about what the final layer is like like you're basically saying we cannot know the ultimate truth right that's what you're saying um of reality and for most i i would say for most human beings on this planet that does not sit well well, I and it, it's even stronger than that, like, because Tom's not actually saying, and this is something that Tom and I have gone back and forth over in private, and I don't, I still don't know where I land, where I've landed on it. But Tom says something stronger than simply that we can't know about the fundamental, like, you know, metaphysical reality. Tom says that we can't even assign probabilities about it. Like, so we can't even make assessments of which one is more likely than another. So, for example, if you have any uh, theory that's 
equally compatible with the data, like there's no way to make an assessment about which of those theories uh, that are equally compatible is more likely to be true. Well, I kind of agree with that, though, Cam, because even like take the, uh, I know. I know. we've talked about it with you too <laughs> yeah like even the multiverse theory could be within the framework of a matrix right so what, oh yeah of course yeah so it's kind of like you're yeah anyhow yeah I, I know but like my point of view has always been that like um there must be some cost epistemically to postulating additional things that are unevidenced and uh, I've always thought that that meant that we had some kind of ability to rank these things. So when we find that within a particular class of explanations, uh, we it's especially problematic when the types of metaphysical explanations are in an infinite class. What we automatically know is that like, if we distribute our probabilities among them via indifference, that they make up like an, like, infinitesimal probability in our probability space if we want it to sum to one. But anyway, this is getting too complicated. But we, Tom and I have talked about this. I'm like willing to just say that Tom's right because I really only care about like the empirical side of the coin, not the metaphysical side of the coin because the metaphysical side of the coin always seems to be too hubristic to me anyway. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that really all that matters is what's demonstrable. And so we can say that's empirically true, regardless of whether or not it's metaphysically true. And the empirical truth is really what matters. But uh, to wrap up this little session of what we've just been talking about, I, I truly think the difference between theists and atheists um, in, in what we're saying here is this need for certainty or this desire to really, really know in an ultimate metaphysical sense what is true and what is false um, I, I just think some humans need that to sleep well at night. I, I think that's true. <laughs> um, and if they don't have it, people like William Lane Craig have this existential angst and they just might off themselves if they don't have this. I don't know. Right. Well, I think I think that's how like cults and things get started because they give you this sense of ultimism, and they they make you feel certain in yourself even if the certainty is false. And people get a lot of emotional relief from those kinds of sensations. Yeah, definitely. And I was bringing up what I brought up before because of the fact that I think that Michael has the same problem in discussion that you and I have had where he actually does think that we have some type of ability to make probabilistic judgments or what he's sort of calling arguments to the best explanation about metaphysical propositions. And you're trying to like, like later on in the debate, you spend a huge amount of time effectively trying to like tell him that's a bad epistemological point of view. Um, it's a bad epistemology. Don't go there. It doesn't work. And, and, and he's like, oh, but you're making metaphysical claims by saying that. <laughs> it was, that got so frustrating. <laughs> Final note, we have extremely strong reasons to indicate there is no all-good, all-powerful God. If it did exist, it would have created the best of all possible worlds, which is a world where it is physically impossible for anyone, including God, to force anyone else to do something they do not voluntarily consent to doing. Anything less than this is by definition slavery and by definition immoral. Uh, a common rejoinder to this is, well, maybe God has some sufficient reason to allow suffering. This is not possible because any possible reason God would have for not creating the best of all possible worlds can always be made morally better if he just made that reason optional and allowed people to choose it or to choose their own universe. Well... There's one problem with what you're saying here, Tom, that I can see, and that is this God could be evil and it actually wants people to suffer and not have freedom. Right. So my objection here is only that there isn't an all good, all powerful God. Okay. But in that case, if this, if this evil God would exist, then the definition of good would now be evil. Everything would be flipped. So you couldn't really say that he wasn't good. He's just good in an opposite way than what we perceive it right now. So no matter what reason you come up with, it will always be available in the best possible world and morally superior because it's not forced on people without their consent. Therefore, no such reason is possible. In conclusion, any argument that can work for a non-God alternative is not evidence of a God, like the rabbit in the box analogy. The same problems that prevent scientific 
claims from justifying metaphysical pro properties also prevent theological claims from justifying them. All metaphysical properties are unsupported by any known form of knowledge and are bald assertions which necessarily work for all of the alternatives. Metaphysical properties allow for an infinite amount of ad hoc reasoning, so you can always solve any problems with them, and so they also work for any of the non-god alternatives. Even though I grant there is a necessary thing, there is no evidence that tells us anything about it. Pantheism is simpler than theism, and the problem of involuntary suffering rules out Christian God and makes an impersonal necessary thing like pantheism the better explanation. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Okay. So you were just under two. Both of you were just under 10 minutes. Those are two incredibly fascinating opening statements. So before we go into the back and forth, we have about 45 minutes. You guys were each a little bit short, so I'm going to take a few moments to just kind of explain what a horrible taskmaster I am. So uh, please do your best not to talk over each other. I know both of you are incredibly respectful of, and, and it's probably not going to be an issue, but just to, just to lay it out ahead of time, uh, I'm probably going to interject I feel as though there's something that may be a little bit too convoluted or needs clarification for the viewers, uh, but ultimately I'm going to let you guys kind of guide this conversation. Uh, Tom, since you were the last person to present, Mike, I'd like to give you the opportunity to open this dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote a bunch of notes I'm on there. A lot of stuff I want to go over. Um, Tom, two things about when you, you said simplest explanation uh, being the thing. I mean, like, right. if, if we're going with the simplest explanation, uh, I was just wanting to ask Tom, what did you think about the fact that he's making a case for um, deism or theism as opposed to making a case for a specific God, like the Trinity um, Christian God? Well, that's usually an approach theists take where they just start off with something simple, just start with the one thing that can indicate a god over a non-god, which is the consciousness aspect. And then if you can grant that, then they can go into further arguments to lead into Christianity. So it's usually just a debate tactic to start with just those things to be as broad as possible, not to give your opponent as many opportunities to debunk your argument. Yeah. You go, Doug. I was just going to welcome uh, Paul uh, Apologia in here. Yes, we've gone an hour and we just finished the opening statements because we've been commenting. Like we have 600 IQ points in here right now, Paul. Like we got to, you know, make use of those IQ points and and uh, <laughs> let people know what we think. What were you going to say, Cam? Now oh, you got to say something really brilliant. <laughs> Frogs. <laughs> Actually, what you've missed, Paul, is basketball buttocks and what else um that i'm gay oh, yeah <laughs> doug being gay there we although go. in my argument it had to be false for it to work so it was really saying Doug. <laughs> have i told ever, cam have i ever told you about my tea count that i had no, I haven't heard anything about that. I don't think that's, <laughs> what you that's tell me? an accurate representation of what like Occam's razor would say. We go with the simplest explanation that is necessary to explain all the data. So like, sure, we go with the simplest explanation, but if it doesn't explain all the data, then we, we have to posit something more. I mean, that's why we don't posit an Aristotelian version of cosmology, because it, it's simple, but it doesn't explain all the necessary data. So sure, simple is great, but if it doesn't explain all the data, would it, you agree that it's not the best explanation then? Correct. I would agree. Okay, so then, like when I presented my arguments, I specifically argued for properties of a mind. I, I looked at specific things in emergent space time, consciousness, and whatnot. Um, so, why would it be explained by naturalistic pantheism then? Well, your arguments are just false. Why? Uh, first argument you pre presented was the. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you basically, uh, you remind me of my cousin Leon. He basically says, I deny the premise of your statement. Digital physics argument where space-time is emergent. Yep. That's a theory promoted by Nima Arkani Hamad, who is an atheist. And to quote Nima Arkani Hamad, he says, like most physicists, I am an atheist. So that the fact that space-time is emergent has nothing to do with the mind at all. It's just a, can be a, emergent from natural properties of the universe, which is in fact the consensus in physics. The consciousness perspective is a vast minority position. Okay, in fact, well, to go to your, that was your first argument. Your second argument yeah. was the consciousness mm -hmm. uh, from presented by von Neumann and Wigner. No, no, uh, Wigner, I, 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 I formulated that one. It was based on their work. Right. So Wigner himself specifically said that he was wrong to apply um, uh, micro level things like uh, quantum physics to macro level things like consciousness. So he admitted that was wrong. And when the polls were taken, a physicist of this kind of position, it goes in the single digits. Michael's agreeing with you a lot here. Physicists just completely reject that consciousness has anything to do with okay, quantum well, physics. Okay. Well, a couple things about that. A couple, a couple things Go about ahead. that. I mean, you mentioned one, I mean, that's, there's, there's not one physicist that has presented emergent. I mean, there's numerous. I mean, it goes back to like people like Leonard Susskind, Martin Rees, Mikio Kaku, Brian Green. I mean, it's not just coming from this, well, this one guy you mentioned. I mean, yeah, he does. But I mean, like Herman Verlaine argues for this. I mean, there's numerous physicists that argue for emergent space time. I mean, a lot of them theists, like, for example, Stephen Barr, for example. Um, so there are, this is not just coming from one physicist. It comes from multiple. And a lot of these seem to be a little bit of appeals to authority. I mean, I'm more interested in the evidence. When Einstein presented his special religion. I think that Michael might have misunderstood you there because I don't think that you were saying that emergent space time is a concept that is like not widely held or not um, likely to be true or something like that. I think that what you were saying is that those people who hold to emergent space time don't think that it 
says that it's a mind, right? Right. So his argument was, is how do you explain this data without, without employing consciousness? And so I just gave, here's how is it explained by these people without consciousness. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think he understood that. Activity, he put in a fudge factor because he couldn't deal with the idea that uh, space someone have a beginning point. I'm more interested in their actual evidence they present, not their philosophical conclusions. So, I mean, sure, they believe that, but for the same reason, I don't think Galileo was wrong just because the consensus was against him in his day. Right, the consensus says that evidence is false, it's wrong, and that the people interpreting it to being its evidence of conscience are just wrong. Like to quote David Chalmers, in any case, all versions of the interactionist dualism have the conceptual problem that suggests that they are all less successful at avoiding epiphenomenalism than they might seem, or at least have no better than the naturalistic dualism, even on the views, there is some sense in which the phenomenal is irrelevant. We can always subtract the phenomenal component from any explanatory account yielding a purely causal component. So the consensus in physics, most physicists are naturalists, most physicists are atheists. They just reject your interpretation of the evidence. So that doesn't mean the evidence is wrong. We don't go with, I mean, in 1950, most scientists rejected the Big Bang. So, the so there's, a pro there's a problem here is that I think that Michael would be happy to admit that he's not an expert in quantum mechanics, nor is he, is he an expert in a subspecialization of quantum mechanics, in particular the foundations of uh, space-time, like, you know, effectively emergent space-time via quantum mechanics or quantum field theory. I think he'd be happy to admit that he's not an expert of that, but yet he's like arguing that we should sit here and have him a non-expert and Tom a non-expert duel it out over the particular evidence and the particular arguments that various physicists give for their position, as opposed to doing what I think is like the epistemically humble thing is to defer to experts. And the way by which we do that is by like broad surveying a broad range of them and asking them what they think about this question for those ones who have evaluated it. And then having some type of confidence judgment based on where the field lies, which is what Tom's saying about how consensus is a relevant factor in our assessment of scientific theories or scientific propositions. And he's effectively by doing this and asking us as individuals to engage in, I think, a poor epistemology. I don't think we should be doing what Michael's suggesting. Right. If anything, what he's, what he's saying is exactly the same as what uh, climate change deniers say and evolutionist deniers say. They always say, well, we have to look at the evidence ourselves and just judge it for ourselves. We can't go with the consensus. No. Yeah, and but he's not an expert, so he should be admitting that he's not capable or at least has less capability than an expert to evaluate this. And so I, I just think that it's not a, a good debate tactic, really. Um, well, a majority of uh, ex experts could still be wrong. And oh, absolutely. And that's the thing is that's why arguments from consensus of experts that m m m make sure you have that qualification, consensus of experts, that is not an argument that says that this point of view that the consensus holds is right. It's that like there has to be some type of like burden that one who's supporting a proposition that goes against that holds in order to defend their view against that. And a minimal requirement is being able to demonstrate that you're like uh that you understand the consensus position in the first place that you under you have the tools and the the capability and the expertise to evaluate the thing that you're pretending to make a judgment on and did, did, i doubt that he has that did he say i i forget i don't want to rewind it either but did, did he say that he built upon he, he did his own stuff built upon two other experts yeah, he built upon the von Neumann Wigner consciousness collapse thing in order to make his argument for the conscious one of the conscious ones. Don't remember which one. Yeah, it's the second argument. It's the cosmic uh the cosmic consciousness argument. Okay. And um Okay, I won't say anything. Being a survey in his book on that. So just because the consensus was against it doesn't mean it was wrong. I mean as, as Max Planck said, as Max Planck said, science advances one funeral at a time. Just because some people reject it, like when the Big Bang came out, or like right now, there's still a majority of evolutionary biologists still holding the modern synthesis, even though a wealth of data and EvoDevo research has been showing that we need to update that to me to change it. I mean, just because there, that's the is, it doesn't mean the evidence is wrong. Let's focus on the evidence, not what we're told to think by people.
Right. The way science progresses is by consensus. You have to convince the consensus. That's the way science progresses. Just the fact that one guy said so or a few people said so doesn't qualify as sufficient evidence. You have to so, convince the consensus. That's so how science progresses. So then by your logic, the, Earth, the geocentric model was correct in Galileo's day? Or I'm sorry, the, helo or the geocentric model, yeah, was correct in Galileo's day. Because it was about consensus. Then whatever the, whatever, whatever the I mean, that sounds like an ad, ad populum fallacy of anything. No, because back then it was run by the church and they just dictated it by fiat. That's the not current true. Model <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think that that was the right response, but I think that the right thing would have said would have been to say, like, given the available data and the best epistemic methods of the time, it was the one, it was the view that was least likely to be false. Um, which I think probably would have been true. So what, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that the Ptolemaic model of predictions of the planetary orbits and this position of the sun in the sky and the position of the moon of the sky, that particular model had a very, very high degree of empirical success um, in accuracy of prediction because it actually did give really good results for a very large variety of astronomical phenomena. And... It's why it was held to for quite a long time. Even when, like, the, Perker the Copernican view came around, there were actually deficiencies in the explanatory model of Copernicus, despite the fact that there were simplicities in the, you know, the reduction of these or the, the doing away of these epicycles of, um, that were relied on in the Ptolemaic model. But it wasn't until, like, Kepler and Newton that, like, the the Copernican and Galileo and Kepler and Newton model collectively became like very, very uh, precise in prediction. Um, it, it, Kepler was instrumental for that. That's just my how science progresses. Accurate. Sorry, the but I have to add you on that. You read a book called Galileo Goes to Jail, another myth written by Ronald Numbers and several other historians. The idea that church was sort of like controlling science is a huge modern myth started by one of the founders of Cornell University. Um, wrote a book about it, and he just made up a lot of stuff. Ronald Numbers had correct a lot of these historical inaccuracies. That's not accurate. Was Bruno Giordano burned at the stake or not for arguing that the world rotated around the sun? They were not burned for that. There is no evidence anyone was ever burned for practicing science. Check out Ronald Numbers' book. They were yeah, and there's no evidence anybody was martyred for the belief in the resurrection either, Michael. <laughs> That's what I would have said to that. But um, well, yeah, I just think he's wrong on that. That's just objectively false. Well, I think that like they try to introduce some subtle, like some nuance to the description of it that makes it so the persecution of them under the Inquisition and things like this wasn't a, di a direct result of scientific views that they were holding, but instead were like a result of. Um, some other kind of theological thing or I, I don't exactly know how they what because to be honest i haven't read the literature that they refer to but this is like a really common thing that theists are claiming at the moment they're saying they're coming out with gun, guns blazing saying that the point of view in the popular culture about like galileo and you know the his um what he faced in opposition with the church and like Bruno and or whoever that person is it Bruno? Yeah. Giordano Bruno, yeah. Yeah, that you referred to that like the popular representation of that is not accurate. And I don't know whether or not it's true, but it seems to be more making um minute distinctions that don't really actually make a difference. Okay. Yeah, it just seems like they're doing more post hoc reasoning, like the no true Scotsman fallacy of some kind. They they weren't real Christians. They weren't doing it because of religion. It's not Jesus' fault. Well, I think they're trying to say that it wasn't explicitly because of the scientific views that they held. It was for other reasons, but yeah. So is Michael actually saying that religion hasn't impeded science here or in any way? Oh, yeah. He definitely yep. holds that point of view yep. that religion hasn't impeded science. Not ever? That's like I don't think so. In fact, didn't you talk about that with him in your debate with him? Yeah. Uh, Are you talking about me and him? Yeah, you. I I think. Oh, I might be wrong, but no, I, I don't think we I talked about that, that. But yeah, maybe not. Maybe it was somebody else. But but if it he, was him and somebody, that's just stupid. If he believes, yeah, that. I agree. 
I well, I mean, they they for example, like they make the, the the following types of claims. They make the claim that like the supposition of a god with uh, a uniform nature gives us like a groundwork to do uh, science that makes assumptions about a uniform operating nature of the world or the universe. They make the claim that uh, well, c- Christians, Christians, and like. Christian institutions were instrumental well, in the, I'm not denying um, any of that, Cam. Cam I, I, universities I, I, and the educational institutions that led to the growth of science. They make all sorts of different claims that... Well, yeah, I understand. I've heard it all my life. But the thing is, I would grant them a lot of that, but they would have to at least grant me a little that religion has impeded just a little bit, just a little bit, just a scotch. Come on. You come on, like you can even think about in vitro fertilization. I had to go through that with to get my two kids. The pushback I got from Christians was huge. Just with your, yeah, like and we can use modern examples today, like stem cell uh, research. Exactly. Like, right, and I think that actually the modern examples are much more clear cut than the historical ones, unless you like are a historian. Um, I know Richard Carrier broadly disagrees but like there are even people for example uh the guy who does the history for atheists website um shoot his name's slipping me right now um i'll find it in a moment yeah uh, science and superstition does not mix very well together and (laughs) tim o'neill like Tim O'Neill, for example, does a lot of debunking of atheist claims about the Dark Ages and a, a lot of this type of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I did a video a long time ago, and I'm trying to remember. I had, I had a whole list. It's somewhere on my hard drive of examples of where religion impeded science. Now, I, and granted, I, I grant that religion was the first step to even coming to knowledge of, of getting sciences and epistemology, the scientific method. Um, and it's done a lot of great things in that most people were religious or theists uh, who are scientists. But I have a feeling Newton, Galileo, if those guys live today, uh, my money is on that they would be atheists. Right? Would you guys bet, make that bet? Well, I would actually disagree on the first part you said, where uh, religion was the first thing that led us to philosophy and science. Well, I would, I would say it was more the Greeks and the Stoics without religion. Me too, yeah. I, I think that the Greeks really laid the But those Greek guys believed in gods just like all the rest. Jupiter yeah, well, there's a good case for that. Like, and... Aristotle, for example, certainly wasn't an atheist, and or at least from my understanding, and he definitely was one of the strongest people to show interest in experimentation with the actual empirical or physical world. Okay, let's keep going. Or burnt for some like ad hoc reason because it. it seems like they singled out the people who argued this, like Darwin and Bruno Giuliano. It wasn't just a yeah. random choice. They but again, this is irrelevant right. to the debate. This is irrelevant to the debate. So going back to my point, most physicists, the way science progresses in today's society is by convincing the consensus in the scientific field, not just a guy published a paper that does not make it credible. You have to convince okay. the consensus. The consensus can be wrong, though, wouldn't you agree? Yes, it can, but it's less likely to be wrong than a guy published a paper and says. Okay, well, I didn't. So I cited several papers. I, I cited Great, several. that's still less than the consensus. So my. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's really good, Tom. And that's exactly right. It, you made the same point. It's less likely to be wrong. That's the right point of view. Like, it's not It's not a claim that it has to be true because of the consensus. Mine is still more supported than yours is. Um, I don't really care how many, pe- how many votes we can take. I care about evidence. And that's what I like to focus on is the actual. Yeah, I care about evidence, says Michael. But it seems like, Michael, do you realize that people are looking at the same evidence as you are and coming up with different conclusions in the, in most of the cases? Yeah, Maybe we something all wrong care with you, about Michael. the evidence. <laughs> Michael, if you're ever watching this again, we all care about evidence. We think it's fundamentally impor- important. And in fact, like our entire epistemologies are built, or at least Tom's and I's, are, 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 are built off um, uh, forms of, or definitions. Of, or to, yeah, yours too. Well, yours is a bit more wishy washy, Doug. But <laughs> it is more ball for basketballs. <laughs> but. We all value evidence too, Michael, but it's just that we acknowledge that we might not be the best experts to evaluate 
experts to evaluate that evidence. And I try, dude, I try. I've been studying quantum mechanics for 10 years, or actually more than that, 13 years. I, I, I took quantum mechanics at university. I did uh, second year and third year papers in it. I... Um, I continued reading books on quantum mechanics, like actual textbooks, and continue to do so. And I read philosophy of physics in Foundations of Quantum Mechanics too. Um, but yet I don't try to tell everybody that I'm an expert to be able to evaluate these things. And I still defer to experts who can. And I'm acknowledging of the fact that there is a variety of points of view that disagree with my own and that those views could be could be totally right, and I don't use them for as arguments against God. So, someone who's an expert in quantum mechanics, Cam, let's let's say they're here at a ten. Uh, should I put you at an eight? Yeah, probably like a seven or an eight. Seven, eight, and Michael, where would he be? Well, I'm only really going by certain mistakes that he made in the video. Like, for example, right at the beginning or close to the beginning, he uh, made a statement that I think directly violates the no communication theorem in quantum mechanics. So that's like pretty elementary stuff. Like, I mean, you, would don't, you don't learn that in third year quantum mechanics, but as soon as you start on like quantum foundations, you learn that. Um, it, which, which was the statement? Because that's the principle that you can't tell which spin is going to be in the entangled particle correct yeah but he effectively made a statement that there was information being transferred faster than light in in collapse um but that's that's not what um that's not what happens <laughs> um yeah actual evidence um another right, thing i tend to take position that the majority has a better understanding of the evidence than you do or those few guys that publish the paper do okay well at, at the end of the day i'm going to go on the evidence i'm not going to be told what to think by a majority rule right you mentioned i am too and i'm going to go with the majority who understands it better than you do fine you can claim that all you want but if you can't actually present evidence or a better explanation i can say i'm justified in saying i have the best explanation you said something else you said there, we, there's no such thing as top-down causation in science oh yeah you're right yeah Cam. See, this, this is the point where he got confused but that yeah, it's understandable. Uh, no. What? You said it's talking about top-down causation. The looking at the world from a top-down perspective of looking for metaphysical absolutes is a wrong way to look at the world. Okay, well, the, I mean, they've, they've talked about top-down causation or control of visual processing in some published papers. I'm not talking about top-down in the way you are. I'm saying metaphysical absolutes. You can't start with metaphysical absolutes. Well, who said we're doing that? I started with the evidence and build arguments from there. Right, I'm saying any type of metaphysical absolute, if you add it to a theory ever, it's immediately unsupported. So if you think your God is all-powerful, you're immediately wrong. I didn't or you're immediately unsupported. That. That's fine. My introduction is in general against all cases of theism. So if you believe in a God that's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, personal, eternal, conscious, or any of those infinites, you're immediately unsupported. That yeah, wasn't a rebuttal. We, that was we, present, we present other arguments to back that up. We don't just argue from just asserting ad hoc. Yeah, Tom, it's a cumulative case, don't you know? <laughs> I covered that. I covered that in the introduction. It was part of the introduction. Yeah. But it's interesting because I did like that here, your rhetoric helped to try to force him to defend an actual view of God instead of trying to defuse it. Because really, thus far, he's really only made reference to a mind. But you know that it goes along with a whole bunch of other properties that he asserts. So, Oh, yeah. I guarantee you. I don't guarantee you. I'm like 95% confident that Michael believes in spiritual warfare and demons and angels and maybe even ghosts and, and uh, like, yeah. And this is all tied up with this consciousness of a greater mind that he's trying to prove here. Fuck. But I mean, the three right, and, and, I'm focusing on are compatible with deism, theism, anything right now. I'm just arguing for basic theism. As I said, I'm a classical apologist. If I can't get you right. to see theism, I'm not going to go any further. Right. So again, my point is that no form of human knowledge can ever justify those kinds of absolute properties. They're completely ad hoc. Can you define what you mean by justify? Support, make it reasonable to believe with evidence or argument in some sense. Why, can, why can't I make arguments that are reasonable to believe based on the data? Because no form of human knowledge can justify metaphysical absolutes. That was kind of and the point of the... Everything you just said cannot be justified because it's a metaphysical absolute. 
I never said any metaphysical absolute. What are you talking you about? Did. You just made an absolute claim. So here he's trying to use like the same type of trick that led to Precepts. or partly led to the downfall. Well, that's not how I see it. No, no, I think he's trying to use the 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 internal critique or self critique trick. Uh, like oh, for example, verification. in verificationism in the um, in the the school of thought of um, logical AJ positivism. Air. Yeah, of AJ Air. Um, the verification principle was effectively self refuting because that principle itself couldn't verify itself. That's false. Um, that's yeah, not correct. That, that's, and I don't hold that point of view either. But the thing is, is that that is what he's trying to do. He's trying to say, like, because of, because in your epistemology, you, you're making what he thinks is a metaphysical claim. Therefore, your epistemology is like self refuting or somehow. No, I didn't. I said no form of human knowledge, the limited kind that we currently have, which is not a metaphysical absolute. That it's sounds the like an absolute knowledge that we have. No, because there could be other knowledge out there that could justify it that we just don't know about yet. So it's, it's only possible. a claim about human knowledge, not a claim about all knowledge. It's possible, but I'm on, I don't care about what's possible. An equal, as you said in your previous talks, an equal number of things are possible. I care about what's the most probable explanation. That's why I argued for the most probable explanation tonight. Just because there are other possible explanations, or just because there was a, we took a vote and not everyone agrees, that doesn't mean my arguments are wrong. Just like it didn't mean Galileo was wrong. It would have been absurd right. if, the, so, if the opponents of Galileo, the, uh, the it was the Dominicans. Yeah. The I actually uh, want to respond to Chongo in the chat. Only defending classical deism tonight. Interesting. I do find that interesting as well, Chongo, um, because classical deism is worth nothing. Did he say classical deism or did he say classical theism? He said theism or deism. Yeah. I, Early, I, earlier in the discussion, he said on theism. He, but this specifically, the one recently, what did he say? You want me to rewind it? I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, because I think he said classical theism. I heard deism. But I might be wrong. I I'm, I'm totally might be wrong. I'm like 50-50 now that you said that you heard something different. Well, because I thought I heard him say deism early on in the conversation as well. He did, yeah. He said theism or deism. Well, I care about what's the most probable explanation. That's why I argued for the most probable explanation tonight. Just because there are other possible explanations, or just because there was a, we took a vote and not everyone agrees, that doesn't mean my arguments are wrong. Just like it didn't mean Galileo was wrong. It would have been absurd right, if, so if the opponents of Galileo, the, uh, the, it was the Dominicans, yeah, the Dominicans, if they would have said, no, no, we're right because we got the consensus. I mean, actually, they didn't even argue about it. I don't okay, think so far enough. Yeah, I, I really don't want to rewind it, but someone, okay. someone, um, Chonko's is with us, with me on this one that he said deism. Um, but I, it's good but, to know. But even even if he didn't say the word deism, he's 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 talking about some nebulous theism at least. Like he's he's talking about just a mind, right? And it seems to yeah. me, it seems to me, dare I say, disingenuous for a Christian. I think he's, he would even call himself an evangelical Christian, but maybe not, um, who believes a man... I don't know if he is. Yeah, uh, but I th he believes a man rose from the dead and died for his sins and all the stuff that goes along with that. Um, to feel that he's the most comfortable in, de in defending this nebulous mind, consciousness. It's like... like I'm just thinking of... of of uh, really conservative, hardcore apologists, they're, they're kind of like just, what are you doing? You know, we have we have the Bible. You don't need to go here. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to go with the consensus, and given that the chat is saying that he said deism, <laughs> and Doug is too, I'm going to go with deism. <laughs> you well, know, I, you're, all, you're all experts at listening to language, right? <laughs> Well, I would disagree with Doug here a little bit. I don't think he's being like evasive or anything. That's because the topic of the debate is just does God exist? We didn't specify any particular kind of a God. So he just seems to be following the format of the debate. And he just picked the simplest arguments to indicate a conscious kind of a God, which I think is, is totally fine. He's totally all right to do that. And if I can disprove the arguments he presents, then it's still fine for the purposes of the debate. Yeah, yeah I, I'm I'm with Tom as well. I do find it curious because, like, I I do like the people who, you know, take take their view and they, you know, really represent it to its full. But, re like, as a debate tactic, I think it's a good debate tactic not to do that. Not to do what? 
Or when you recognize that the case to support the view that you actually hold is much harder than a case to support a view that would still be worth convincing somebody of, then taking the case that's worth convincing somebody of is still like a good way to do a debate. Yeah, um, I think I understand what you're saying, but I, I think it's, I disagree with you then if I think I, I understand you correct, because I, the people that Michael Jones is trying to convince, if he's trying to convince anybody at all, I don't even know why he debates. Why, Michael Jones, do you even debate? Why do you do this? My guess is you're doing this because there are people out there who are sitting on the fence, doubting what they believe in Christianity, and want good reasons to, to stay in it. And you're providing these great reasons for these Christians to stay in Christianity, aren't you, Michael? Isn't this why you're doing this? And if that's the case, then he's defending some nebulous God. And I always think of Cy Ten Bruinkate when I talk like this, because he's, he's probably applauding me right now and saying, this is absolutely nuts what Michael's doing here. He's, he's defending this concept this of a mind that can be in like us, that's simulating a universe and all this sort of thing. But, um, but yeah, it's, I think the evidence is just so, I think guys like Michael knows that the evidence for specific Christianity, specific theism is just so terrible. They have to start here and, and sort of somehow make the prior probability of a man rising from the dead somewhat higher by, by convincing people that there's this God or something. I don't know. You see what I'm saying, Cam? Yeah, I do. But Still I mean, it, it, in William Lane Craig's debates, he at least gives arguments both for a God and for Jesus. Even when he's, if I recall correctly, debating simply the proposition, does God exist? Okay. I, I'm just saying, like, when you're debating a guy like Tom, your, your debate... Your whole purpose is for the people listening. It's not for Tom. It's not for Michael. It's for the people listening. And the majority of the Christians listening, I think, even though they're going to applaud him and cheer for him and say, hey, yeah, he's on my team, they're going to say, no, no, no. Why are you? No, this is not the way to do it. My argument was that there, there is no evidence. There's no more probable explanation. They're all equally probable because all the arguments are false. They indicate the absolutes with zero precision. They indicate they with nothing, like the square root of a pork chop. That your argument is effectively the square root of a pork chop, therefore God. Why? It's completely not. Right, because no form of human knowledge, because no form of human knowledge can justify metaphysical absolutes. So go to, to go back to my example, all evidence of the natural world is not evidence. There is no supernatural. Would you agree with that? No form of knowledge can justify metaphysical absolutes. Is what you're saying? Yes. That Which is, is demonstrated by all. No, it's not. It's, it's an argument about human knowledge. The limited amount of human knowledge is not a claim about all knowledge. You're still making that claim that your human knowledge, my human knowledge, cannot justify metaphysical absolutes. Therefore, you cannot right, make that absolute claim. Nope, that's an epistemic claim. Well, I reject it then. I don't agree with it then. If it's okay, just an epistemic that's, that's claim, that's just how you're determined knowledge, but that's not going to address which is justified. Which is justified by all of the problems in philosophy and science which prove it to be the case. That no known form of knowledge can indicate metaphysical properties. Like the problem of undetermination and induction and the problem of the criterion and the problem of universals and Agrippa's trilemma and the problem of easy knowledge. That None of those arguments, those all fail. All of your arguments you fail for the reason of those likely. You're being pretty aggressive here, Tom. Did you feel like you're being aggressive? Uh, maybe it's because I have a cold. He's getting cranky. <laughs> oh, yeah. And maybe that's why I was cranky with guys like um, Kokel. No, you were cranky with him because you were giving up smoking. I mean, no, uh, no. chewing nicotine. Yeah, like I was, for people who don't know, I've, I'm addicted. I was addicted to nicotine. I still am. I'm addicted to nicotine and caffeine. And I've given up have both. You had any, have you had any more? No. I'm, uh, well, let's I'm, all let's all praise Doug and say congratulations. Okay, yeah, it's hard to do. For the, well done, dude. for the Christians watching this on replay, I gave nicotine is one of the hardest drugs to give up. I, I wasn't addicted to smoking; I was addicted to nicotine gum. Anyhow, I won't tell you that why, but um, I gave that up. I'm uh, on close to two weeks now, and I also gave up caffeine at the same time. I, I did this because I have macular degeneration in my eyes, and and it's probably best I give those two things up. And I didn't have to pray once to a God to help me. <laughs> um, and it's like... I'm surprised. Yeah, it's... 
but maybe I'm just weird uh, and different and I have, but it's like a lot of Christians, if they had to give up this addiction, these types of addictions, they would be praying on their knees every night for God to help them through this. It's like, no, you can do this on your own. Your best explanation of metaphysics. Well, it means any argument that tries to indicate the metaphysical is just false. It does not do it. It cannot do it. It is the square root of a pork chop. Just what false. Is, what is your evidence that it actually is metaphysically false? That's a metaphysical claim. You're making metaphysical claims saying that they're metaphysically false. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm saying it cannot support or justify the metaphysical claim. I'm not saying it is metaphysically false. I'm saying the evidence does not justify a metaphysical claim. That is a metaphysical claim. No, it's not. It's an epistemic claim. No, you're making claims about metaphysics. You're saying we can't do X in metaphysics. And I'm saying, okay, that's a metaphysical claim. No, I'm saying we can't do X in our current limited epistemic knowledge. We could possibly do X if we had metaphysical knowledge. We do not have metaphysical knowledge. We have epistemic, limited knowledge. How do you know knowledge. we don't have metaphysical knowledge? That's a metaphysical claim. I don't. I can't prove that we don't. But you would have to actually justify that. that claim. I can, I can show that no form of human knowledge can justify that claim. If you think we can't have metaphysical knowledge, you cannot tell me I cannot have metaphysical knowledge. That's a claim about metaphysics. No, it's a burden of proof fallacy. You hold the burden of proof to justify your metaphysical claim. I can show that no form of human evidence can justify it. Okay, I'm not, I, you're thinking about confusing justification and absolute proof. I'm arguing for the best explanation. I'm not right, arguing for I'm saying there is no best explanation. There is. Did you want to say something here, Tom? Oh, it's just, it's just, it's really silly that he doesn't get this. It's like saying, there are three apples in this box that I am holding. This is not a metaphysical claim. It's just a claim about the knowledge that I have the access to. It's not saying, but if you make the claim that there are like three apples in all of the universe, that is clearly a very different claim. Like it's obvious the difference between these two claims and the level of justification required for them is completely different. So why do you think Michael's not getting this? Because if he did, then he probably wouldn't be a theist. He has to believe that you can justify all powerful, all knowing, all good properties. Otherwise his God is unsupportable. So he can't, he can't grant this even if he wanted to. Hmm. There's absolutely, could be right. absolutely nothing that indicates those conclusions. Zero percent indication. There isn't the best explanation. They're all just unsupported completely and totally in every respect. Again, you're just, you're making these absolute claims and I don't see any evidence to accept these absolute claims. Again, those are all the problems, the biggest problems in philosophy and sciences, which is why science doesn't make those kinds of claims. Yeah, and the it, same and when we, also apply to theology. The same when, reason science can't support metaphysical naturalism, theology can't support metaphysical supernaturalism or God. Okay, well, yeah, when, when epistemics come make that, I just invoke particularism. If you're going to make these absolute claims, you actually need to show that I should accept them. I mean, there's no reason for me to accept those absolute claims if I can't, if you can't show you can justify those claims by your own standard. It's pulling the rug out right from under you. Unless you reject all of the commonly well understood and accepted problems in every field of knowledge, then that's a justification of why you should accept my conclusion. No, the problems in knowledge are just basically we can never absolutely prove something 100%. That doesn't mean we can't reason to something. I mean, this would be absurd if we, if we applied this in elsewhere. The problem isn't absolute certainty. The problem is a metaphysical absolute property. So I am grant that you're totally fine in not saying you have absolute certainty there's a God. The problem is that you are applying absolute properties to a God. The absolute properties are what are necessarily unsupported. What absolute properties are you referring to? All powerful, all knowing, all good, uh, necessary divine aseity. Where did I say that in my presentation? Oh, see, now this is where the rubber hits the road. And he, this is where he's backing off and, and, and defending this nebulous, intangible, weird... Uh, definition of God that almost no one holds to. You didn't. My, my first statement was an introduction. It was not a rebuttal. I was not rebutting your introduction. It was my introduction. Well, that's why I'm asking. I'm asking you now because we're in the discussion part. Right. So that was my introduction. Oh, that's yeah, my that's, position. It has nothing okay. to do with your position at all. Okay. But this is not really addressing my arguments. You're just trying to make these absolute philosophical claims, which I reject. Because again, sure, there are problems in knowledge. We can never absolutely prove something other than the fact that I exist and I'm experienced. At this point, did you, I don't know if you did this because it's the first time I'm watching this, but you should just ask him, do you believe your God is all powerful? Do you believe he is all loving? Uh, let's see if you said that, ask that. Experiencing something, but that doesn't mean we can le at least reason to the best explanation. I mean, if, if, if what you're saying is true, I mean, we have to throw out dozens of scientific theories we can never absolutely prove because science doesn't deal in proof. Science doesn't even really deal in falsification anymore. If you read someone like Emery Lakatos and Paul Firebender, they're wonderful book called for against method again you're confusing epistemology and ontology i'm not saying the problem is absolute certainty i grant we don't have absolute certainty i'm totally okay with that the problem is when you add absolute properties to a theory all powerful all knowing all loving if you add those to a theory then you require absolute certainty or they're unjustified essentially no you don't because you're just yep. you're just making an inference of the best explanation if no, I the, those can never be the best Adam, those can never be the best explanation. remember go back to my analogy all of the evidence of the natural world is not evidence there is no supernatural why why is that the case 
All of the evidence. Th say that again. All of the evidence of the natural world, given all. Reed uh, Nice Wonders asking a good question. Can a metaphysical claim be less than certain? Isn't the whole point of metaphysical claims uh, certainty? Well, that's what would make them justified. You can make a metaphysical claim that isn't certain, that isn't justified by anything. Like, there are only four apples in the universe. Like, that's a metaphysical claim, but it's just not justified. Yeah. So, Reed, I think the differences between ontology, the, the, what do you, how do you define ontology simply, simply, the essence of things, what things really are. What exists. Yeah. Um, versus uh, epistemology. Making claims, how we know things. Yeah. All of the evidence of the natural world that does not indicate there is no supernatural. Why? Does not indicate there is no supernatural? So you, it's, all of the evidence does not indicate naturalism is true, is what you're saying? Correct. Correct. Metaphysical naturalism. Okay. okay. Actual naturalists will argue from evidence in the natural world to make inferences to naturalism. Sure, they, uh, they understand they can't prove it. They understand they cannot prove there is no supernatural when you're a philosophical naturalist. But they still just argue. And then the, the theist makes arguments, and then the naturalist makes counterarguments. We make objections. We're just arguing to the best explanation. We're not arguing for absolute certainty or that we can absolutely know or anything like that. I mean, anyone who so tries most... to con like numinal phenomenal distinction says there's this absolute distinction. You look like you're in pain there, Tom. Yeah, what do you say? It's just so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can tell in this part of the discussion that you're getting frustrated with him, but I think it's like a common. I I think that it's common to confuse that to confuse ontological claims with epistemological claims, and I think it's common to fail to see how universal claims are different from particular claims, if that's the right way of expressing it, um, and. I think it's hard to convince somebody because I've been a person who's been hard to convince that universal claims can't be justified uh, by assessment of probability of their being true. Um, so I can see why he's having trouble. And I don't think it necessarily means that he's dumb. He's made some dumb mistakes, I think. I think the fact that you're trying to convince him that metaphysical propositions can never be justified is a hard pill for him to swallow, like you were saying before, because it means the rejection of his entire theology. What right, and it's two of his premises in his earlier arguments were that consciousness cannot have the property or matter cannot have the properties of mind or something, which is the same kind of claim, like saying there could be no supernatural. It's just an absolute claim about everything which just can't be supported. It's totally ad hoc. What do you think he would say, Tom, if you were to ask him, do you believe it It takes a deity to know one? Because that's basically what you guys are talking about here. You're saying, basically, you have to be a deity to know a deity, to make these claims about de being a deity. Right, because of uh, uh, Wittgenstein in his Tractatus Logical Philosophicus, in the introduction, he talked about the paradox of logical omniscience. You can oh, yeah, that's, that's totally what Doug was referring to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Doug knows this by heart. But yeah, it's the same problem. It shows that you can't ever show that you know everything because that would require you to have knowledge outside of yourself. Right. There's the paradoxes in these infinite properties that just can't, that these can't be justified. See, Cam, the way I say it, it's just, it's easier and it, it's more rhetorical and it's takes a deity to know one, right? It just it gets the point across. Which <laughs> yeah. is making an absolute claim about the nominal, and that's... You, you didn't answer my question. You didn't answer my question. Why I'm, is all of the evidence of the natural world not demonstra demonstrative that there is no supernatural? Okay, I, I was... Explaining. Even the metaphysical naturalists don't agree that. They all agree that there could be a supernatural out there that we haven't discovered yet. Every single one of them. Yeah, and I agree so, there could not be. I, I, but again, you're trying to say this sort of demonstrates. Like, why does the natural world not demonstrate naturalism is true? Because... Metaphysics, science does not deal in absolutes, it's not deal in absolute proof. We argue to the best explanation. When a philosophical naturalist argues for naturalism, they don't argue that they absolutely can prove this. No one this, claims that. This is where I should have come back and said, and pointed out to his previous arguments where he said, the matter cannot have the properties of consciousness, and just said, well, nope, yes, they can. Because you just admitted that you can't say they cannot. Wait, 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 yeah, wait. that would have been useful. Okay, I, I, would, I would love to talk with you about this, Tom. So... He has framed, and this is something that William Lane Craig does as well, 
Um, but he has framed his arguments in a deductive form. Like they're, you know, presented as like some type of logical syllogism. And um, yet he's talking a lot in the conversation about things like abductive reasoning, like arguments to the best explanation. And I guess that part of it is that he's talking about, well, that's how he justifies certain premises that he has within his deductive argument. But it also seems like sometimes he's kind of thinking about it as like the whole thing is like an abductive argument. Um, I've, I went through this phase and I like, lost confidence in most of the utility and deductive arguments other than showing what propositions were like incompatible with other propositions. And I lost confidence in my ability to use it as any type of epistemic tool to like come to conclusions because of the problem that uh, the model representation of a deductive argument only involves like a, you know, bivalent um, aspect to the propositions, right? They're true or they're false. And we're never in a position epistemically where we can actually affirm them. Um, we can say that we believe them, but like we almost always have some type of uh, more fine grained assessment of the likelihood of the proposition being true that goes that's different from the belief and then we know through basic probability theory that like you can have two propositions that you both believe but the conjunction of them you know that your assessment of the conjunction should be lower than 50 percent and so automatically that tells you that like the structure of deductive arguments doesn't work for uncertain premises at least that's my point of view and right. so i Right. It pretty much just represents some kind of a linguistic framework of how you understand the argument to be expressed. It doesn't actually correspond to reality in any way. It more corresponds to something in your head. Right. And it, sh and it doesn't really even, or it shouldn't correspond to like an epistemic process because, um, because it's actually an invalid representation of an epistemic process when you can't affirm the proposition uh, with like 100% confidence. Because I think that in a deductive argument, that's what the affirmation of a premise represents. It represents absolute confidence in its truth. It doesn't represent just belief in it. And because if it just if it merely represented belief, then you run into the problem of, you know, you know, degrees of belief in a probabilistic framework telling you that this deductive argument is logically invalid. Um, and, you know, be, because it doesn't model the, the actual states of your brain with respect to the premises. But the Willem Lane Craig and IP, you know, they still continue to represent these deductive arguments. So I was just interested in what you thought about it. Well, I think they just it makes more sense. It sounds better to people. Like what Doug was saying earlier, people like certainty, and deductive arguments give that sense of certainty. And if you add in the most likely or indicates with some level of probability, it takes away from that feeling of certainty that's what makes these arguments so compelling to people. That power goes away. <laughs> yeah. Well, it yeah, it, Christians like to hear other smart Christians talk, I and mean, it gives builds confidence that what they're believing is not stupid. That's why William Lane Craig is popular. Naturalism is true. Because metaphysics, science is not dealing absolute loose. It's not dealing absolute proof. We argue to the best explanation. When a philosophical naturalist argues for naturalism, they don't argue that they're absolutely can prove this. No one may claims that. Right. So if you said there is a God, if we had equal evidence for a God, that would not show there wasn't a greater God somewhere down the line that we haven't discovered yet, correct? Yeah, it's possible. Doesn't mean it's probable. Which means which means if you made this statement that there is the God who was uncreated and there is by definition no other God, you hold the burden of proof to try and demonstrate that, correct? Uh, I hold the burden to show evidence, yeah. And just like the fact that there is no evidence, the, all of the evidence of the natural doesn't prove there is no supernatural, doesn't even indicate there is no supernatural, the same thing applies to God. So all of these metaphysical claims are unsupported. That one's due to the problem of induction and the problem of undetermination. Yeah, but you, can't, <laughs> you mentioned the problem of induction. That does not mean we can't. This is see. This is the thing: is that this is the fundamental disagreement in the discussion, which mirrors a lot of our disagreement. We've been talking over it. Is that you can't convince him of this in this short amount of time? Like, in fact, I don't even really think he understands what you're saying. 
Yeah, this is a part of my personal epistemology, the thing I wrote. So convincing people of it is hard because it's purely my idea. So getting it through to other people is something I haven't figured out yet. So yeah, you're right. And in some ways, like because you're coming from these two epistemic points of view, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how to explain it other than the the disagreement is more foundational than just like claims about what exists. Like uh, incommiserability, Thomas Kuhn. Yeah, something like that. Can't do induction just because there is a problem of induction. That sort of supports my point. Just because we have a problem of induction, that does not mean we still cannot make inductive arguments. Correct, but again, you're confusing epistemology and ontology. You can't make metaphysical properties absolutes and justify those. You can't ever do it. It's not possible. I'm not saying that. science right. never does. I'm not saying that. That's why, the, uh, that's why theology is wrong. Why? You can never support absolute properties like all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving. All, -knowing, all, -loving. all of those are out. Is it absolutely true theology is wrong? No, it's absolutely true that all human knowledge can't justify those things. Is that absolutely true? No, that's not absolutely true. It's true based on human knowledge, the current unknown human knowledge. So you're absolutely making true. you're making an inference <laughs> of the best explanation. I love it. I love it how you go. That's why theology is wrong. <laughs> <sighs> it's so blunt. <laughs> it's it's almost as blunt as like your the first thing that came out of your mouth. Well, I think it was the first thing that came out of your mouth in the rebuttal period where you were like. It's because your arguments are false or something <laughs> like that. I mean, we can't do induction just because there is a problem of induction. That sort of supports my point. Just because we have a problem of induction, that does not mean we still cannot make inductive arguments. Correct. Correct. But again, you're confusing epistemology and ontology. You can't make metaphysical properties absolutes and justify those. You can't ever do it. It's not possible. I'm not saying that. science right. never does. I'm not saying that. That's why that's why theology is wrong. Why? You can never support absolute properties like all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving. All, -knowing, all, -loving. all of those are out. Is it absolutely true theology is wrong? No, it's absolutely true that all human knowledge can't justify those things. Is that absolutely true? No, that's not absolutely true. It's true based on human knowledge, the current unknown human knowledge. So you're, you're, making, you're making an inference of the best explanation? I'm making a deductive explanation of all human knowledge, which is limited. That's exactly like I what I'm saying. I presented deductive arguments. And none of your deductive arguments work. They all fail, and I can prove they fail by saying, oh, look, they fall into this problem, which eradicates that explanation. So that How? doesn't indicate anything. I do because of the big problems, the problem. they prove they do not indicate your conclusion. I the do. reason scientists don't ever make these claims is because they provably false. They do not indicate anything. Scientists don't make these Sci claims? No, scientists do not add metaphysical properties to things like that. Yes, we have they to, by add. definition. Metaphysics has to be involved in science. That's just the basis of understanding basic philosophy of science. And no, you, it doesn't. Read, Instrumentalism is one example. That's just false. No, you don't. Phenomenalism is another example. You don't need to do that. Have you read for an example? AJR rejected metaphysics completely. No, you don't. What is the basic tenets of, what are the basic uh, parts of science? What are the basic parts of science? Three parts. Uh, I would just go with some way to differentiate between our imagination and our experience. We need some methodology to... Is he talking about observation? Uh, repro repro reproducibility is that what the three things he's looking for hypothesis uh, no oh I that I didn't know that so he's not talking about oh he's not talking about the scientific method he's talking about science in general yeah I wasn't sure what he was talking about he said I'm not sure what he was asking you if you look at philosophy of science the basic three parts would be ah there he was talking about the philosophy of science shaping principles data and theories we always start with shaping principles. That's why when we look at the moon, we don't think like Aristotle did that it was an intelligent being. We all have these metaphysical prejudices. That's how we look at data. From the data, we build theories, and then theories reshape our shaping principles. Theories are conceptual, data is empirical, uh, shaping principles are metaphysical, and they're always working in conjunction with other. This is separate, something Emery Lakatos points out when he's responding to people like Paul Feyerabend that are anti-realists and say something that the crazy stuff that like science is art, and you know, or Thomas Kuhn, who, sort of flirt with that idea at some points. But the, the, the idea that we don't have these metaphysical prejudices in science is just not backed by philosophy of science. Yeah, it is. It actually is. You're just wrong about that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so again, all science agrees on this. You can't ever add those metaphysical properties or your conclusion is immediately unsupported. It's why science doesn't do it. 
It's why theology is wrong and why everyone rejects it in science for the most part. You, keep you can't add those metaphysical claims that theology is wrong, and, I, and then you right. keep saying, saying, I can't make absolute claims. I'm, it's confused. Right, because I'm not making an absolute claim about all knowledge in the universe. You are. I'm making an epistemic claim about the limited amount of human knowledge. That can be justified. Your claim about all possible knowledge, that can't be justified. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is the best explanation. I'm not saying that I'm making claims right. about absolute all knowledge. You can't ever claim an absolute metaphysical property is the best explanation. Not supportable. That is an absolute, though. I mean, you can't... Nope, that's a claim about human knowledge. That is an epistemic claim about human knowledge, which can be justified. Your it's claim cannot be justified, claim. but it can be justified. It's an absolute metaphysical claim about what humans can do with their knowledge. That is an absolute metaphysical claim about what we can do with epistemology. It's not an epistemic claim. It's a metaphysical claim You're about it. You're equivocating between two different kinds of metaphysics. You know, I think that you might be able to make like another um, analogy here. You might be able to say, for example, um, we can make the statement that our eyes lack the capacity to resolve something uh, one centimeter apart from a distance of 400 light years unaided like maybe that's sort of like a helpful way to say like i'm making a claim about us as humans um and our epistemic limits i'm not making a claim about something that a, a universal claim about what exists but, I don't know. But the problem is, uh, as I think Mike Michael said, he hasn't made any absolute claims about his God or a God that he's defending. Has he? No, but again, that was my introduction. So I was saying my position. He's responding to my position, okay. not his position. Right. So he is, he is pushing back hard against you on something that he's not even trying to defend, correct? Well, not with his introduction, but I would say he's probably going to try to defend it if I asked him about, like, does, does you believe your God has these properties? Yeah, exactly. Right, and that, that's what I said about 15 minutes ago. I'm curious to know if you actually just point blank ask him so we can get through this. But He so doesn't. He doesn't? Tom doesn't. No, I, mean, I just assume that that's, he's already going to believe that, so there wasn't really any point to ask him because I already know he believes that. Which I think is why he's going to the mat for it. He's going to the mat to, you know, defend the, that we can, or that we, what is he trying to say? Like that we can know metaphysical propositions? Right. That we can justify metaphysical propositions with some kind of probabilistic assessment. For that, it doesn't even apply to my argument. It doesn't refute anything I've said. So again, we can justify claims about human knowledge because we have access to human knowledge. We cannot justify claims... Oh, Simon Funk said he said classical deism. So some, I guess some people are rewinding the tape and, and uh, listening to it again. It's about metaphysical knowledge. We don't have access to metaphysical knowledge, except for things like I think therefore I am. Uh, what metaphysical... Just, arguing this is a metaphysical thing is irrelevant to the argument. We don't have access to metaphysical evidence is what you're saying. Correct. That's why I gave empirical evidence. I relied on data that was presented in peer-reviewed papers, and I argued for the best explanation from that. What empirical evidence did he give? Well, he argued that there was some test that verified the, what was it, emergent universe thing, the holographic principle or something. And then he said, well, this can be explained by consciousness. Yeah. Um, he also referred to, like, the delayed quantum eraser experiment and the um, the Liggett's, Liggett's experiment, I think it's called, and the, um, a, couple, a couple of other ones. But is this yeah. empirical evidence for a god? No, he just wants it to be. No, he thinks it's empirical evidence that supports particular premises in an argument for God or for a mind. See, but this is all just arguments from ignorance, is it not? Yeah, well, that's exactly what I pointed out. I can explain this with natural phenomenon without any appeal to the consciousness, which means it's not evidence of a consciousness. I can't think of any other way to explain this except for this great, great mind. That's basically what I'm hearing Michael say. Am I summarizing it incorrectly? More or less. He, he phrases it more carefully to make it not as obviously flawed, but yeah, that's what he's saying. <laughs> yeah, I, I get this a lot. I summarize a lot of Christian's positions on things, and I get... Um, what was your summary, Doug? Oh, what did I say? Um Barely. I can't think of any other way to explain this other than a big, great mind. <laughs> yeah, that's that's 
Michael Jones's position. I can't explain consciousness uh, any other way other than this great big mind. Done. That's basically his argument. And he's using like all these uh, deductive syllogisms uh, using and, and the empirical evidence that you guys talked about, which doesn't, it's not evidence for, capital F, capital O, capital R, not evidence for a God. It's evidence for something else that he somehow says, I can't explain any other way, but a God must have done it. Well, he is making an argument to the best explanation. Right, right. Though, it's so most probable. That is, yeah. Like an argument to the best explanation is in a way saying that this is the best explanation of the data, like, which is in part a concession. I can't think of a better explanation. Right. You'll mean so, it. yeah, yeah. It, it is. But, but then like abductive reasoning is something that's used in science like all the time. So it's kind of hard to say like epistemically he's on shaky ground except for the distinctions that Tom's making about how he's using it to support metaphysical propositions, not just empirical ones. No form of empirical evidence qualifies as metaphysical evidence. Doesn't okay. Category here, doesn't it? That's a metaphysical claim. No, that's an empirical claim. That is a metaphysical claim for sure, because you can't empirically study that. You can't empirically find that. That's a, that is a shaping principle you have. There, you're, you're, you're forcing your shaping principles and it, trying to no, say- it that, only be no, it would only be a metaphysical claim if I claimed we would never be able to. We could potentially in the future be able to, so it's not a metaphysical claim. You said we absolutely cannot. With the current limited knowledge we have, it would only be a metaphysical claim if I said we could never do this. Okay, but you're saying, you said earlier, absolutely, that we cannot have access to this. That is an absolute with claim. Our current, only with our current human knowledge. It is not an absolute claim. It would only be an absolute claim if I said it was. it will never be possible. Okay, but the problem is, is that... That is such an absolute claim, and there's no reason to. There's no there's empirical absolute, evidence. To that. Again, no, no. Again, your claim applies to all knowledge. There is a being who was not created. My claim only applies to human knowledge. This should there should this should be an obvious difference, extremely obvious. My claim only applies to human knowledge. Your claim applies to all the universe's knowledge. Your claim is unsupported. Mine is not unsupported. I'm making metaphysical claims. I accept that. I'm, I'm arguing from the evidence of the best explanation. You're making metaphysical claims about humans are capable with our current knowledge. No, that you're equivocating language. I'm just going to say you're wrong. Stop. Yeah, he he's defining even the word knowledge as a metaphysical thing because it's based on consciousness. So it's all wrapped up in what he views as a mind. And yeah, I don't. Yeah, I wasn't. I'm not sure how he didn't get this. That the, there's a difference between claiming human knowledge can get this conclusion, which is not the same as saying all possible knowledge that ever existed has this conclusion. Those are two different claims. They have different burdens of proof. Mine is supportable because it's only about the things we have access to. It's defined by the things we have access to. His is not supportable because it's referring to things we do not have access to. Well, yeah, and he would disagree with that. He'd say we do have access to it. And, uh, and he, the evidence that he gave with quantum theory and all this so forth and the similarities between the what, the mathematical formulas of certain things and shows that the best explanation is a great big mind i mean my claim, you want, but... my claim <laughs> only applies to human knowledge your claim applies to all knowledge yours is unsupported mine is not unsupported this is purely obvious there's a different <laughs> different quality of evidence required to justify these two claims they're not the same you keep trying to equivocate them you're wrong okay i'm just going to interject for one second and the reason I was just going to say, I'm wondering why the moderator, moderators are not stepping in because you guys have been going back and forth about this for at least 10, 15 minutes. The reason I'm interjecting is because the people in the chat who are watching are, are asking for a little bit of clarification of what the differentiation might be between metaphysical knowledge and natural or empirical knowledge. Please, so that'd be that, that would be really, right, really so helpful I to the people watching. So in my introduction, I defined metaphysical claims as stopping points for truth where there is, by definition, not something beyond it. The would fundamental you, nature of reality is nothing beyond it. To ensure that you're both on the same page, Mike, would you accept that definition? Um, I need him to clarify a little bit more about it because I don't think I do. I'm a little suspicious what, what, what he just said. Let's work on that, too, because I feel like you guys might be talking past each other and it's confusing for the people that are watching. So if we could just agree upon at least that point, I think that's a better starting point. Good job by Shannon doing this here. For the conversation going forward, if that's okay with you two. Sure, clarify. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. 
All right, so I define metaphysics as the fundamental nature of reality, which is a stopping point for truth where there is no more truth discovered beyond it. Beyond it. So it's only the final truths. Okay, so if it's only yeah. a tentative claim, all of the stuff we currently know, that's not a metaphysical claim. It's only a metaphysical claim if it's an absolute claim where there is nothing beyond it. No, I, I don't think that's absolutely true. I mean, I think metaphysical, you can make metaphysical claims and then not say that there's nothing beyond this. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of confused on where you're going with that. I mean, sure, metaphysical claims are about the whole nature of reality. Yeah, the way I think I would describe it to a guy like uh, Michael is to say um, a metaphysical truth is a truth that God knows and is not wrong about, his God. Then he would say, oh, that's what you mean. Okay, got it. Yeah, that would probably make sense. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is theism, naturalism, can we even know if these things are true or not? Those are all metaphysical claims. But I'm confused what you mean that we can't, they have to be like absolute. I mean, I don't think anyone says they have to be absolute. So to take methodological naturalism as the position, we have no reason to believe in the supernatural. We only have reason to believe in the natural. Metaphysical naturalism is the position there is only the natural. So that's a metaphysical claim because it's metaphysical naturalism. It claims there is nothing beyond it. There is only the natural. Methodological naturalism does not claim that. So you can dif differentiate between the metaphysical claims and the methodological claims. The metaphysical ones are absolute claims where there's nothing beyond this. The methodological claims are not. Well, methodological naturalism is a method. It, I mean, you can be a theist and be a methodological naturalist. Right. So it's essentially we have no reason or no justifiable method to demonstrate there is anything but the natural. Are you I, I like the quote while Shanks in his debate with, uh, I forget who he debated. Are you, are you saying methodological naturalism claims that we cannot make claims about the metaphysical? Methodological naturalism is a method that we can use to determine the natural. We don't have a method that we can use to determine the supernatural. Okay, well, yeah, that's just one method. It's not even accepted by all philosophers of science, even at that. I mean, it's Except just it's a method for studying the natural world. It's, 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 a, it's actually a philosophical shaping principle. It's a shaping principle. It's how you ought to view the world. And it's metaphysical in that sense. No, it's not. It has nothing to do with metaphysics at all. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> that's what <laughs> He just belts there. <laughs> Did you say excuse me? It's not, not, natural, not metaphysical naturalism. They have a word for the metaphysical naturalism. It's called metaphysical naturalism. Well, you can't discover and methodological naturalism. You have to assume that principle. It's not assumed at all. Yeah, it is. That's no, it's not. Very basic of philosophy we, of science. We cannot discover the no, science. That's, that's immediately false. That's immediately false. Refuted by every scientific, every sci philosopher of science out there. It's been repeatedly debunked. Metaphysical, methodological naturalism is just that we have a method to demonstrate the natural. Yeah, as soon as it doesn't that. refute the, the supernatural, there could always be a supernatural. And if we discovered it, then there would be a methodological supernaturalism. It does not assume there is no such thing. It just shows we have no way to demonstrate there is such a thing. Right. I never said the methodological classroom says that. It's a method, though, but it is a metaphysical principle that people impose when they're trying to do science. It's a shaping principle. Yeah, he hasn't defined, like you guys are getting back in the loop. This is where Shannon should probably step in. Maybe she does soon and get back because you've given your definition of metaphysical. But has he really given his yet? No, but at the end, he says he essentially agrees with my definition or accepts it. You just, you just said that it assumes there is no supernatural. That's false. If I did, then I misspoke. No, I, it doesn't say anything about that. It's a method. Right, but it's not, and it's not metaphysical. It has nothing to do with metaphysics. It says nothing about the fundamental nature of reality. It just Definitely says this is, is a, has nothing to say about metaphysics at all. The Completely underlying wrong. principles that impose methodological naturalism on how we do science is philosophical in nature. It's a metaphysical uh, principle on how we ought to study the natural. No, it's a method, and the method can change. Yeah, it has nothing to do with metaphysics. But there's no empirical evidence to to prove that methodological naturalism is how we ought to behave, or how. Why does he keep using the word "ought," Tom? <laughs> He's probably conflating the moral oughts with some kind of scientific ought, scientific values of some kind. Yeah, because you're just talking about, hey, this is just a method of how we arrive at this thing we call knowledge. But we could change our minds. We could change the method. There's no oughts here. And it's not assumed. We, we've demonstrated it has success. We, we start with this system, and then the system produces results. It's no longer assumed. We have results. It works. Doesn't it, you don't need to assume it anymore. I just can't help but think that Michael has been so indoctrinated into the, um, you know, the things that William Lane Craig says with scientism and verificationism and all this sort of thing. Uh, do you think this is where this is coming from? <laughs> probably. It's probably just making the same kind of uh, argument 
to try and refute the scientific methods of verifications and falsifiability just by saying they're self-refuting. Same kind of argument. Yeah. How we ought to do science. Right. If it did, that would make it metaphysical. No, that would make it empirical. If we had actual scientific evidence to show that this principle was true. No. Uh, metaphysics is the fundamental nature of reality. It's beyond, beyond empirical. Empirical isn't metaphysical. Yeah, but I mean, we're talking about methodological naturalism. That's a principle we assume. We impose. I mean, the scientific method cannot be discovered by the scientific method. We have to assume that is true. This is what basic philosophy of science 101. The scientific, we have to assume the scientific method is true? That doesn't even make sense, that statement, does it? No, essentially we just say, maybe this is true, and then if it's true, let's test it to see if it gets results. And then if it gets results, well, now we have reason to believe it's true. You don't have to assume it's true. You can assume it's false until tested to see if it gets results. Yeah, but I wouldn't never use the word true to describe a method. It's just either effective or not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I agree. What is about? Is, is Cam is not on camera anymore? Cam not on cam? Yeah, he's, I guess it was too hot in his house and he took off all his clothes. Ah. Assume that I'm the, still here. The, <laughs> the scientific method is somehow empirical and therefore true and absolute. It has to be assumed. And this is a philosophical, this is a metaphysical uh, shaping principle that we start with. When he says shaping principle, is that basically a philosophical jargon for um, uh, some predisposition or pre pre uh, supposition to how you see the world? Is that what he's talking about here? You know, like uh, the theists always claim that atheists have a presupposition against miracles. Is that like a shaping principle? Yeah, sort of. It's more like a set of criteria that we can use to filter through possible alternatives. Right. So he's basically trying to set you up as having a self-defeating position. It's not assumed at all. It's just a method that we try and see if it works. We, we assume the method, yeah. No, it works. We demonstrate it works. We don't have to assume it works. We can't demonstrate it works. We can only make inductive arguments that it works. Right, and that gives us good reason to believe it works because they work, because it shows success. Exactly. So we can do induction, we can do deduction, we can do all these sorts of things. I'm just doing the same thing. That is my argument. But we can't ever make metaphysical conclusions about the nature of reality using those ever. It, why would I accept that absolute truth? Well, give me one good empirical reason. It's not an absolute truth. It's just a truth about human knowledge. It's an epistemic claim. That is definitely an absolute truth. You are again. This, this should be concept. really, really simple for you to understand that my claim only applies to the limited amount of human knowledge, and your claim applies to all knowledge. There's a huge difference there. It should be super obvious. Well, no, I'm talking about our knowledge too. Because... Yeah, I'm just wondering if if you would have just couched it in a more softer way, if you would have just accepted it, and you guys would have moved on. Um, is it just the Maybe. fact? Is it just the fact that you sound dogmatic about it that he's rejecting it and just pushing back as a sort of a knee-jerk reaction? Maybe, definitely a little testy because of my cold, so it's possible. Yeah, because we can't get beyond our knowledge, we can't be, get beyond our subjective experience in that sense. So I'm talking about what we can find with our human knowledge and what we can make inferences with our human knowledge. Right, and you seem to not realize there's a contradiction there that with our limited human knowledge, we can justify claims about all possible knowledge. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we can make, make an all-powerful being that wasn't created. Those would be metaphysical claims that cannot be justified with human knowledge. We can make good inferences based on our knowledge, though, on what is the most can't likely. Can't make any inferences at all. No yes. more likely at all. Why are you keep making these absolute claims? Like, you, what do you mean we can't make inferences? Well, they're not. Again, you keep you keep making the same mistake of confusing epistemology with metaphysics. I mean, this, this is just. I mean, I would highly recommend you check out a book by Thomas Nagel, who's an atheist. Called I'm sorry, the you're just wrong. It's just not even not even something I can take seriously. I mean, so to go back, gonna... let's go back to your argument. Digital physics is wrong because Nima Akarni Hamad and many of the physicists who support it, most physicists are atheists. Most reject that it has anything to do with the mind and comes from. Well, I would not have predicted this, Tom. I would, not, <laughs> yeah. I, I would not have predicted that this debate would have gone there. It's like, you're like me on Kokel. <laughs> that sounded like crack. But <laughs> yeah, this was, this was pretty brutal. Uh, Natural cause. Consciousness, the Wigner example, again, mostly rejected by physicists. Wrong. Wigner himself rejected it. And then the, the introspective argument was your third argument. Argument from ignorance. 
it was it's it's a more parsimonious explanation to say that mind is explained by some physical force we haven't discovered yet than hypothesizing an entirely new category ontological category of thing so again the naturalism is a simpler explanation okay and well, let me also just, accepted by most academics in let me most offer rebuttal to all those really quick okay the first two arguments consensus is an ad populum fallacy that doesn't change anything an argument from ignorance would be saying the, uh, God exists because it cannot be proven false. Just making a, an actual deductive argument is not an argument from ignorance. And if you're going to say that it's more likely that the, the consciousness emerges from the brain, I actually need to see some evidence that consciousness emerges from the brain. I mean, I, I have seen materialists have made several. Yeah, see, this is the problem. It's the default position, I think, for him is that consciousness is some Im immaterial X factor dust that comes from the mind of a big God of a big mind whereas your default position tom is that no the the mind consciousness just all comes from physical processes and so he's asking for evidence from you to prove that that um that it can't be uh i think he's saying that that it can't be something intangible i think that's what he's doing here yeah we go into that next i think real future testable prediction which it turned out to be false Okay, so on the last one, uh, yeah, you've rephrased the argument from ignorance to make it seem like not an argument from ignorance. I can do the same with anything like lightning. How is it There's an no argument? difference. It's, uh, it's because we can't explain it, and you then assume it's not natural, or that it's some fundamentally different thing, just because we can't explain it. with the. How is that not assuming naturalism? You're assuming the conclusion you want. It's got to be natural, so it's an argument from ignorance. Because everything we've discovered in the universe so far has been natural, and so we have good inductive reason that this will also be natural. Just like assuming we don't explain, we couldn't explain lightning three thousand years ago. The best explanation is it's an undiscovered natural thing, not so that there's a new category of reality to explain. So you're presupposing naturalism, and, and no matter what the evidence says, it has to be natural. Whoa! No matter what, the, you're not saying that at all. Natural because you're presupposing naturalism. No, I'm not presupposing anything. There is more evidence for naturalism than anything that is. Yeah, you're, Tom is basically saying you're saying Tom that. The best explanation is naturalism. <laughs> Isn't natural. Well, you've not given any. Science. Science does not All indicate. Science. Didn't you just say earlier that naturalists could not use the natural world to justify naturalism, and now you're saying science is justified that all that exists is natural? No, I'm saying that we have more empirical evidence that the things that we see in the world are probably going to be explained by natural causes than a new category of thing which we have no evidence to support at all. Okay. Okay, so for the people listening, what Tom is saying is we see a black duck, we see a black duck, we see a black duck, and then the question is, what color is the next duck? <laughs> it's probably going to be black, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a different color. Consciousness, is it natural or supernatural? Um... Everything that science has shown us so far has been explained through naturalistic means. Doesn't seem like we need any pixie dust involved to explain things with using the scientific method. So odds are, just like we didn't understand uh, lightning 3,000 years ago, uh, we don't understand consciousness today, but odds are the greatest, pro most probable explanation is that it's natural, completely natural. We are apes I well, gave evidence to support it your evidence was i really would like to know if guys like michael jones thinks that apes and other animals have consciousness and where do they draw the line wrong i just proved that wrong so do you have you any have other evidence the evidence you argued from consensus with an ad populum fallacy you confused what an appeal to authority appeal to ignorance is i mean no, none of these are this is just assuming naturalism and then when a new evidence comes about no 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 that can't lead to anything other than natural because we know naturalism is already true because we have all this evidence for naturalism but i'm not going to give any because we already know naturalism is true this is just assuming naturalism and i wonder if he's assuming supernaturalism <laughs> yeah except with no supporting evidence behind it yeah do you have any comments to make? Is that why you showed your face, Cam, or you just? No, I'm just back. Okay. Uh, no, that's objectively false. It's like if we if we have a box and we pull out a red marble, red marble, red marble, the most reasonable conclusion is the next one's going to be a red marble. Oh, yeah. yeah. I use black ducks use red marbles. If you okay. say it's going to be a different marble that we've never seen before, that's not evidence. Well, that's, that's an argument of ignorance. That's a caricature of my arguments. I would be saying that I've actually pulled out a blue marble, and here's the evidence for it. Here's the like I, get, I gave evidence in three arguments, and your only reply seems to be consensus, consensus, consensus. 
Science works based on consensus. That's a valid argument. No, science works on, uh, as Emery Lakatos notes, science works uh, on progressive and degenerate so, research. So science says that all these marbles we pulled out, these are also red marbles. The consensus says these are also red marbles, so they're not blue marbles. You haven't pulled out a blue marble. The consensus disagrees that these are blue marbles. That's a good argument. Research programs. Every research program has a course, as an auxiliary hypothesis, which helps move it along. Um, and these are things that kind of move things forward and backwards. There's multiple paradigms. As even Thomas Kuhn notes, re scientific revolutions are basically quasi-religious. They don't happen instantly. These take times for things that we're seeing it right now in evolution. Because a lot of scientists are starting to say the modern synthesis needs to be updated. And other scientists are saying, no, it doesn't. So this is a very interesting debate. Wait, did he just admit that when things go slow, it's quasi-religious? <laughs> no, you well, I think he was saying that like the change of scientific consensus or the, the, the establishment of scientific consensus is kind of like a religious process. Happening between Wait a minute. No, never mind. Between Evo Diva researchers and neo Darwinists. I mean, this doesn't happen instantly. This is research programs are progressive. I would highly recommend the book For and Against Method by Emery Lakatos and Paul Feyerbin. Right, and I just say you're wrong. Science works based on consensus. I mean, what you're just saying is just ad hoc. It's like, no. I mean, I'm actually appealing to philosophy of science books. I don't know what to tell you, and you're just saying I'm wrong because. That's ad hoc. No, I'm saying that science works based on consensus. We know it does. That is not, that is, I would, what philosopher of science has said that? What, what philosopher of science? I'm tempted to say, who, who, why should we care what philosophers of science say? Is anybody else here tempted to ask that question? Yeah, I, I did that later, a little bit later. Oh. I can definitely find you some quotes and email them to you later. I mean, yeah, consensus is very useful, but that's not how science works. If that was how science worked, we'd never change anything. Because the consensus would always just be like, yep, this is what we're sticking to. We would never move from geocentrism to heliocentrism. We would never have moved from thinking the entire universe was the size of our own galaxy to the vast size it is now because consensus would have said, nope, we can't change because this guy called Albert Einstein published a paper somewhere. We can't change. Uh, that's not as, you, as you just noted a few minutes ago, actually, it does change. It do yeah, exactly, because it's not based on consensus. It's based on evidence. It's based on shaping principles, data. Which data, data. the consensus. The evidence moves the consensus. Yeah, and the paradigm is because shifting. Because the people in the field understand the evidence yeah, better than we do. Yeah. That's why I relied on a lot. So it's of probably a pretty reasonable conclusion to go with the consensus in the scientific fields. Because they you probably can, understand this. Look, at the end of the day, you can believe whatever you want. You can have faith in whatever you want. I choose to follow evidence. Ooh, he pulled a Frank Turek on you. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I can tell he's getting a little upset here. Let me rewind that. But the, the bullshit thing about this is that he's trying to say, well, I, but I'm going to trust and have faith in my own ability to assess the evidence in the field. And that's the bit that's dubious because of the fact that he doesn't, I think, have the expertise in these various fields to do that. He doesn't have the expertise nor the consensus on his side, correct? So he's having faith in his uh, cognitive faculties. Pretty reasonable yeah. conclusion to go with the consensus in the scientific fields Look, because they probably can... understand this. Look, at the end of the day, you can believe whatever you want. You can have faith in whatever you want. I choose to follow evidence. I choose to follow the evidence. You seem to be following just a ad hoc offshoot of some minority position that isn't well supported. That's what it looks like to me. Well, I gave a lot of evidence for my position. I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, if I have all the evidence, right, I, you're not giving me any evidence for naturalism. I don't know what to tell you. Right. Well, I just gave the consensus, which says you're wrong. Did he just ask for evidence for naturalism? Did, oh, you're muted, Tom. He might have. I don't know. I wasn't really listening. Just a ad hoc offshoot of some minority position that isn't well supported. That's what it looks like to me. Well, I gave a lot of evidence for my position. I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, if I have all the evidence, I mean, you're not giving me any evidence for naturalism. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, he did. He's asking for evidence for naturalism. Exhibit A. Science. Just all of it. There you go. Well, I just gave the consensus, which says you're wrong. I don't really care. So, and for the same reason, okay. I, would have, I wouldn't have cared in the 1950s when the majority of scientists rejected the Big Bang. 
right? You can just pick any ad hoc paper that some crazy scientist publishes and say, ah, I have evidence of this theory. Well, science doesn't care about your feelings. Sorry. Yeah, well, they, 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 they respond to those and they debunk those if they're crazy. Like, think, think Young Earth creationism. We both dealt with Which that. is exactly what happened with your examples, which is why Wigner rejected his own hypothesis of the consciousness collapse, which is why the digital physics argument is rejected and has nothing to do with consciousness as most physicists are atheists. Again, Neymar Carnegie Mod presents a more physical, fundamental thing where space time works from. It has nothing to do with consciousness. Look, if you're just extending the natural beyond space time, you're just going to make theists happy. I mean, Johann and Ross calls himself a naturalist, and he's a theist. I mean, if you're just saying that what space time emerges from is also natural, okay, fine. That does not prove that, that does not even remotely show my arguments are incorrect. You're just going to extend natural beyond that. Uh, I'm not following your argument. So, if we can show that the space-time emerged from a more natural, fundamental thing that isn't consciousness or has no property of consciousness in the theory, wouldn't well, that it, refute it your... Could, then no, yeah, my argument is we debunk, but you haven't done that. I mean, but... If, that's if, Neymar Carnegie Hamad's theory. That's what it does. Go read his he theory. speculates that it emerges from more natural things, but... He speculates. And aren't you speculating too, Michael? Did you want to say something earlier, Tom? You put up your hand and wasn't quite sure. Oh, I was just scratching my head. Okay. But I mean, that doesn't show that he's right, and he's just speculating, as you even said. Right, and all the guys that you're published are also just speculating. So which, where do we... Hey, we're, we're sympathetical, Tom, on predicting what you're going to say. How do we show which one is better than the other? We make general inferences based on the data that we have. This is how we work with data, theories, and our shaping principles, as I said. I prefer I to go with the general inferences made by the professionals in the field who really understand it. The consensus in the field seems to be like a more reliable way to go than trying to make a judgment based off our limited knowledge. Well, I relied on experts. I relied on numerous sources in there. I have numerous sources in my in my videos. That's why I, I constantly put this in the video description all my sources so people can fact check me. Right, and I just gave you sources that contradict those. So again, how do we determine which one is more supported? I say go with the consensus. It seems pretty reasonable. I'm not going to just follow blindly and believe whatever I'm told to think. I'm going to look at data and, and challenge things. This is how, I mean, take for example, uh, Stephen Jay Gould. Stephen Wait a minute. <sighs> He's going to not just follow blindly the people who are experts in the field? Is that what he just said? Yeah, apparently he's trusting his own interpretation of the data. That's a very... Michael, if you're watching this replay, that's probably one of the most arrogant things I've ever heard someone say on a live stream. Well, that, that's what I was saying earlier on and why I made the point about being humble or like having humility like about our epistemic limits as non-experts. Like we don't have the skill to assess or most of us at least to assess a lot of these particular topics because they do actually require expertise to assess and he apparently doesn't have them at least it doesn't seem like he does i want to get into a conversation with him about actual quantum mechanics talk about real quantum mechanics not just words but something that would demonstrate whether he knows something or doesn't know something about it Oh, well, I could host that or, or um, James can at Modern Day Debate, but I have a feeling not, I don't think a lot of people would watch that debate, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Well, probably the same amount that's watching us right now. And Jay Gould was a functionalist in terms of evolution, and then towards the end of his life, he became a structuralist. He rejected the consensus because the evidence convinced him, and he wrote a very extensive and interesting book on it. I mean, we, we just can't, if he would have just said, no, I got to stick with what the consensus tells me to think, that would have been an absurd way to do science. That's not how this works. Right. And if we were actually writing papers and doing research in this field, then that would be reasonable. We're not. We just have to go with what the authorities say. So we can cherry pick a few papers that support our position on both sides, or we can go with the consensus. It seems like the consensus is more supported from both of our perspectives. Let's just go with what the authorities say. If the Bible says it's true, that's enough for me. I mean, it's kind of said what it sounds like. Why can't we well, think that's exactly what, kind of that seems like exactly what you're doing. You're just cherry picking a few authorities that seem to re re support your, your prior conceived position. And I can just pick different authorities that have a different conclusion. It doesn't make any difference. There. Great. Let's do that. Show me the evidence they present. Let's see what better explains reality. Let's see what's mo more parsimonious. Do it. Let's go. We can definitely do that. Let's go with Neymar Carney Helmont's paper. Yeah. He's, he's or I can just say the physicists have already done this and they've been doing this for years. And the consensus is, is that your position is weaker. Okay, why is it weaker? The professionals have done this. They have come to this conclusion. We could wow. do it too. We could go through the years and years of papers and work to show port this, or we can say these people have already done it. No, no, that's not how we do this. We can we can look and we can read the books. We can read this stuff. We can study this. I mean, I contact experts when I'm able to. I, I email Fred Kuttner all the time because I want to know more things. Okay, 
We don't just blindly go, oh, now the consensus set is, if it gets to 51%, then I'll maybe change my view. But until then, I'm just going to stick with it. That's an ad populum fallacy. We go on evidence. We don't go on what we're told to think. Like the question I would ask, Michael, at this point would be, Tom, um, why do you think so many people, experts in these fields, don't see it the way you do? What's, what's holding them back? Why, why are they missing it? Yeah, so, or like, for really example, good. would you anticipate if you were in a conversation with Sean Carroll that you would be able to convince him of your point of view? Yeah, that's a great question too. That would be really good to ask. Because like, I mean, surely he's aware that the answer to that would be no, and it wouldn't be simply because of some failing of Sean Carroll. It's because Sean Carroll knows about this stuff, and he doesn't. But you, you, but Cam, you know the answer he's going to give, right? He, well, sorry. <laughs> I think I know the answer he would be thinking. I don't know if he'd actually give it. No, I, I think he would give it because he's given it here tonight. He would say the reason why most of these experts don't see it the way he does it's because they have this bias this presupposition against the supernatural they have this shaping that he brought up that that clouds their vision on seeing the evidence that's staring them in the face don't you think Cam? this is what he would say or at least think i think he would think that but i doubt he would say it he Probably wouldn't say it to Sean Carroll directly. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and it's... Because the difficulty is that Sean, somebody like Sean Carroll could just totally call him on his bluff and be like, okay, well, then let's talk about it in detail and let's see if it's just my presuppositions that's leading me toward this. <laughs> and I wouldn't blame Michael if he said that. Like, it's, a, it's about presuppositions against it and biases against it. Because I would be the same way. I would say, Michael, I think you have a bias for it. I think you really want there to be a God. And this brings you some type of comfort, however you want to put it. I don't believe in photons because I built a large Hadron Collider and actually saw one. So another thing that I had to say is that uh, Sean Carroll would actually be a wonderful person for him to talk to because you know how Michael was expressing the like the perspective of emergent space time from quantum entanglement. Well, that's actually something that Carroll is like very actively involved in. In fact, he is like one of the lead um, people in the exploration of this field. So he runs and manages the emergent space time wiki. Why don't we set that up? Why don't we get Sean Carroll and Michael Jones together on my channel? Uh, Reed, are you still in the live chat? Reed uh, goes to the same uh, car dealership as him. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. It's true. It's true. He does. So, Reed, can next, Reed, the next time you see Sean Carroll, can you set this up for us? Reed, you need to go hang out there every day for the next, like, couple of months <laughs> he's got a jag that probably breaks down quickly <laughs> yeah i believe in photons because it was done by the experts in the field yeah and there's a consensus in the field about these things existing and they, they understand the evidence they can make right so the same thing applies to this just like it does to that the consensus in the field photons exist the consensus in the field is naturalism okay that's a philosophical claim though isn't it naturalism what you're talking about the consensus is that methodological naturalism not metaphysical naturalism. Okay, that's just a method that's just a method. Right. You can be a theist and be right. a method. Because we have, we have a method to demonstrate natural things. We do not have a method to demonstrate supernatural things. So we go yes. with the method that can demonstrate things exist. Yeah, same way we would do it with historical claims. We do use explanatory scope, planetary power, at least ad hoc, the most plausible, provide illumination. We just make inferences, as we have done since Plato. We make inferences to the best explanation. Right, I would agree. And but yeah, those can never be for a new category of things we have no evidence for, like the supernatural. So we can believe that there are new categories. That there, the, the evidence in the natural world in, implies that there are these other categories. These are the what did he just say? That there, the, the evidence in the natural world in, implies that there are these other categories. These are these other things based on what we see now. Like what did he just say that? What he did like with emergent space time? Well, I already refuted that and showed the consensus says you're wrong. Other physicists say you're wrong. So I have, I have justified reason to say you're wrong on that. It's not a refutation. The fact, that saying, you, I, the fact that you cherry pick a few papers from people that seem to support your position isn't evidence. That's not a refutation. That's saying, I was told to think this way by these people, therefore I'm right. I don't care what you were told to think. 
Like you have papers that told you to believe this based on the evidence they presented, and I have papers that told me to believe the opposite based on their evidence. Okay, what evidence? Let's go over it. Let's see which is the best explanation. Okay, fine. Let's go through Neymar Carney Hadamad's papers and the entire books that he's written. We can go through it step by step and show that this is the more supportive position. Okay, show me the evidence. What evidence does he present? I mean, I've gone through a lot of these papers, gone through a lot of these books, got, brought the facts up, put it in the PowerPoint presentation, put it in my, put it in my videos to show this is the best explanation. Can you please do the same for me? That's what I thought we were going to talk about tonight. Right, I could. That's going to take a while. Okay, yeah, show that it is a better explanation. I'll just send you the paper and you can read it. There you go. Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's probably going to argue along the same lines. Now, what I've seen in some of his lectures is that he just speculates there be these more fundamental laws beneath us, and that's fine. I'm okay with that. That would not show that my arguments are wrong. In fact, they could very well just be compatible with them. Just because you're extending natural beyond space-time, that does not show my arguments are wrong. What predictions does his model his make? Tom, did he, you talk about future predictions with any of this? Or? No, he just mentioned the ones in the introduction about so the holographic principle, I think. That was, the, that was like it. Like, I could well, I think that those were more like evidences, like pieces of evidence that he was using to support the emergent space-time view. But I, I think, uh, Tom, he, he got you there. Like, uh, you did not have a PowerPoint. Yep, I did not have a PowerPoint. Because I can't share screen on James's thing. <laughs> oh my goodness! It's I'm trying to think how how I would have done it, it differently with him. It's like it's the classic battle of two worldviews, right? It's like um, my worldview. You you have closed Tom. You have closed down your worldview for the to thinking that the, that miracles are possible, that there's this intangible supernatural world, uh, dimension, and that's because you just see the evidence the way that you see it and, and why anybody who disagrees with me sees it that way. Like, I, th I think truly this is the issue. And this is why I think, I hate to say this, Tom, but why I think what you're doing is not gonna be that effective uh, at least for the most part, because we are greater apes that change our minds based on things other than what you guys are talking about. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like until Michael Jones, okay, this is how I would talk to Michael Jones. Until Michael Jones meets a person he deeply, deeply respects and loves and admires, who thinks like you, Tom, He's not even going to budge. You have to find that person in Michael Jones' life that he truly loves, respects, and admires. Who says, Michael, I think you're wrong here. And that might shift him just a scotch. And, and Michael could say the exact same thing about you and me and Cam. Until Cam meets that, that Christian guy that he truly loves, respects, and admires, he's not going to see see it our way at all but i think that's true i think this is how humans actually change their minds in the world for the most part i'd say 80 percent of the time uh how so what do you mean well it, 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 I, I sorry say his name again it's nima really arkani hamad makani hamad i'm really bad at pronunciation uh nakani hamad um i mean if his if he's just showing that Space time is emergent from these more underlying fundamental laws. Fine. I mean, that's what I'm arguing too. I mean, it seems like his argument would be just compatible with my point. I would just point out that this are the same properties that would be a mind, and therefore the universe is most likely emerged from a mind. So, how do you get from more natural properties to it's a mind? Because how are you defining natural? I mean, as you know, you were in. Um, you're you're right. The definition between natural and supernatural is incredibly meaningless, essentially. So, so I I don't know how you go from if it's just more natural properties. Well, let's just drop it. Let's just drop the labels completely. I don't really care if it's supernatural or natural. I'm just arguing that there is a God exists based on the data that we do have. I don't really care if you want to call it supernatural or natural. As I said, Johann and Roth calls himself a naturalist and he's a theist. I don't really care what you want to, if you, what you want to label it, if it's a supernatural God or if it's a natural God, because it'd be uh, compatible with uh, um, uh, Narkani Hamad's uh, work, fine, whatever. That still does not show that God does not exist or there's, there's no reason to believe in God. Right, his model does not have any inclusion of any kind of consciousness, anything. Right, because it's so a model. model that the emergent, so the emergent space-time can be explained by non-conscious 
additions. I, I would it argue like that that is, the underlying principles, we can make the philosophical inference that, that it is a mind. That's what I did in my opening statement. Sure, in the scientific papers, you're not going to see that because they're not making philosophical inferences like you would see in a philosophy journal. I would prefer to go with the physics journals than the philosophy ones. I would prefer to go with both so we get a better understanding of reality. Let's read what everyone is saying, if we can. I mean, it would be wonderful, but, you know, let's try to get a full, better picture. Study philosophy, study physics. Let's go with both. That's what I try to do. I, I study the physics and I make philosophical inferences. I would say the physics journals are probably a lot more relevant and the philosophy ones really aren't that relevant at all. Wow. See, I, that's where I because kind of disagree with you because I do think that um, – the people in philosophy of physics tend to be like trained theoretical physicists, really highly competent in their field and bringing better understandings of philosophy of science to the understanding of what the implications of scientific theories are um, and how to make evaluations between them. I do think that that is the right place to look, um, but it needs to be, types of philosophers who are like highly informed by the physics like such that like for example people like david wallace and david albert who are the two philosophers of physics that i know of that i follow most strongly both of them well they hold different positions but both of them are like trained theoretical physicists because it doesn't seem and, like physics yeah, yeah I, I, would philosophy, I, would just, I would just not go to the probably the physics or the the philosophers of science he's talking about like theological philosophers of science or just pure philosophers of science with no training in physics at all i don't think they're even i don't think they have anything relevant to say to physics michael mendez says in the philosophical paper survey 2013 by borgay and chalmers uh where experts that specializes philosophy of religion found that god theism is the least accepted among experts Yes, Michael Mendez, but you forgot to listen to William Lane Craig explain why you should not trust that paper at all because he wasn't consulted or his friends. Into the field of physics, that doesn't contribute anything to the field of physics for the most part. No, it, it absolutely does. Have you heard of philosophy of science? Right, but it doesn't contribute anything to physics. It doesn't provide any testable predictions or any scope of the, what's currently going on in physics. It looks at the data, looks at the theories, and it makes philosophical inference from this, and this helps shape contribute to shaping principles, gets us a better understanding of philosophy of science. I mean, we need to read people like Emery Lakatos because he did an excellent job responding to the anti-realists. And this is the thing, Cam, I want your opinion on this. Like, I actually do think the whole, I value philosophy. I think philosophy is an important field. I think all three of us think that, but it doesn't build iPhones. Like it, we kind of maybe needed it more 2000, 1500 years ago, but does philosophy really help us build bridges? <laughs> um, well, suggesting that that's like the value that it can bring is um, making like, <laughs> how do I put it? Well, it's kind of like a straw man. It's like, well, I'm just if asking... that's what you expected that it would do, then yes, like you'd be disappointed. But really, like what I more think that it, is useful for is um entertainment for example there is a difficulty at the moment where for the last 25 to 30 years there has been a significant research program within uh theoretical physics um into string theory and it's pretty detached from experimental observation um because in large part because the types of um, experiments that will distinguish between string theory models and other particular theories of physics that are not the standard model, they require like energy levels of an experimentation like far beyond what we can achieve with current technology. And so there is like a relevant discussion there to be had about like, is what people in strength theory are doing uh, good science like is this what we should be using our money for like um, is it likely to turn out to be true like can we assess that prior to having exper experimental observation now that such observation is hard to come by another area is um, in foundations of quantum mechanics where you have these differing views on what our 
physical theory says about the actual world um i i, I, diff- I understand i get your point like i'm not saying that we should throw it out and that's not valuable but i think it's losing its oomph i think philosophy in general is losing its oomph because it's not when the rubber hits the road it's it doesn't matter as much and and i don't think it's any coincidence that intelligent christians they'll go to philosophical arguments right they won't even try to defend things found in the bible or well maybe they'll try but like they'll 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 talk about philosophy and to me that just shows that man they're going there for a reason because it's it's you can't show it you can't justify it you can't demonstrate it and that demonstrates the, the right word you can't demonstrate it one way or another so it's, it's a good go-to tactic is to rely on philosophy to, to prove God because you can't demonstrate it. Yeah, <clears throat> but I wouldn't make the mistake of thinking that just because they do that, that therefore there is nothing of utility within philosophical disciplines. No, I agree. I agree. And But I think it's... it's because it, it, Here's what it reminds me of. It reminds me of saying the following. Um, because Richard Swinburne makes evidentiary arguments for the resurrection, therefore we shouldn't make evidentiary arguments. Um, and I know that that's not exactly what you're saying, but oh, I'm not saying that at it's all. like, well, it's be, you're like identifying how like there's an abuse of philosophical inquiry, or there are poor uses of it. And then, therefore, you're questioning its overall utility. And what I'm trying to do is to, like, identify places where it does have utility, but it just doesn't have it to be in building bridges. Yeah, but what it has utility in, I think, is losing value amongst the general population of the planet. Amongst the general population? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably true. But like, that's, I, like... I really think that... Um, philosophy is 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 more becoming an entertainment thing it's like it's just to sit down on your lawn chair put a cigar in your mouth and kick back some cool ones with your buddies and talk about things that you can't demonstrate one way or another it's like um Mm, i don't know like i have a huge amount of pushback on that because you're talking about two different things like what is philosophy to the layman like what can they do with right now i'm talking about this yeah, but that's like the same thing as saying like, oh, well, you know, science is becoming ever less useful to the layman because like they can't do experiments in their backyard that uncover new knowledge about the world. Like, because they can't, because it's all been figured out. Like, th- that that's what it feels like you're saying. And that becomes like a, a pretty shallow point. Well, do you think that most scientists actually take the philosophy of science seriously or do they just do science and not really care about the philosophy of science? I think that there are examples of scientists who are very successful without paying very much attention to the philosophy of science at all. And there are scientists who have been made incredible blunders in their career as a result of them not being sufficiently informed in the philosophy of science. And I think that when it comes at the... When we find ourselves in epistemic positions where we lack the ability to have data just smacking us in the face, um, where the the right conclusion is so obvious from the data that we have, the more and more important it comes to have uh, like sharpened, honed uh, philosophical methods, it, like a, a good understanding, for example, of so. Here's an example. You know the frequentist versus Bayesian argument within statistics and how folks like E.T. Jaynes help show how a lot of the statistical methods that were being used were actually invalid because one of the broad properties that they failed at is that they did well, two different things. Like one, they discarded information in the process of their statistical analysis. And two, they had the problem of different statistical methods that were meant to be equally valid, being able to arrive at different conclusions. And 
there's a huge amount of bad science, especially like in the medical fields and the psychological fields that have been justified using poor epistemic methods that are corrected by better understandings of philosophy of science. And those those researchers who are more informed by books like Probability Theory, The Logic of Science by E.T. Jaynes have a better chance of like not facing the problems of the re reproducibility crisis that have plagued the fields of psychology and uh, and the medical fields. So there's like a real practical way in which like philosophy of science can help um, researchers do real research and maybe you would say that like it's the statisticians that will help them do that but it's um it i think it's a big combination of you're in a row those people and, and you gotta yeah. throw some people over because <laughs> <laughs> the rowboat rowboat boat's full i'll tell you i'm throwing philosophers probably out of the rowboat f near the beginning of the of the choice selection yeah yeah i don't know I, no, I'd throw the theoretical physicists out <laughs> and keep <Yeah>. the philosophers. <laughs> and yeah. I'd, I'd throw the mathematicians and the, and the theoretical physicists out. You, you guys all seem to think that those are more valuable, but I don't think that they are. I think that any philosopher worth his salt can become a theoretical physicist. But... Yeah, I, I kind of agree with now, that. That's maybe a broad claim, but they're pretty smart, like the good ones at least. It's just it, one thing in philosophy that sucks is that there's lots of bad ones too. Um, but I think the ones in philosophy of science do tend to be better as, as long as they're not those who come into the field with like an extra grind for religion or theology. Apologia, minus 1,000 pine points. He said he would throw at the financial planners. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Shots fired. <laughs> Although I am not a financial planner, I kind of agree with you there. I value businesses for a living, so that's much different. I'm in the financial world, but I'm not a financial planner. Most of I, I, I do I do want to debate on this before. Like, I'd love to hear a response from you on the You're wrong. the like the rep <laughs> yeah the reproducibility crisis in psychology, for example, and whether or not we could have avoided you that predictions. by. And all the people have to know is, does the prediction match the outcome? Don't need philosophy for that. Uh, no, I don't think we could have avoided that because of just the amount of work and effort it would have taken to make it reproducible is just so beyond what is reasonable for most papers. It's, it's, too, it, it's an added layer of work that would make most papers unfeasible to actually accomplish. Right. So you think that it comes down to um, like constraints on incentives and or like things related to incentives and uh, resource and things like that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, see, I don't, I don't tend to agree with that because I mean, I think that the, um, I think the incentives part is a, probably the best explanation there that people have a strong, um, incentive to publish pub uh, positive results and as a result of that they use a variety of statistical methods um and a number of like unconscious ways in which they can p-hack to generate statistical significance and therefore positive results to publish um and they have like a large incentive to do it like the grant models you know uh, affect things and they're anyway but, but Cam, I, I, I want to, you and I have had probably, since I've known you, close to combined at least a thousand interviews, either privately or whatever, with Christians. Haven't you seen that pattern I've seen where they start with, with believe, sit telling you that they believe God is real, Jesus rose from the dead, whatever, based on X, Y, and Z. And when you question them about it, slowly and gently like you're holding a baby in your arms <laughs> by the end of it they the last thing they'll pull out is these philosophical arguments like well something can't come from nothing the first cause cologne it's like that's their yeah, last that's, straw right yeah i i completely concede that and i agree with that but i don't think that's relevant to the conversation no it's relevant because i don't think it's a coincidence 
Well, I mean, I guess the reason why I think it's less relevant is because initially the, the discussion came about because we were talking about whether or not we consult both the literature of physics or the literature in physics and the literature in philosophy of physics. And I was arguing for both, and I think Tom said that he would agree both as well. And you then questioned the value of philosophers of physics. No, but a, philosophers a philosophy. Of, of philosophy. In general. Well, I mean, I guess what I, yeah, and, but then I would agree with you there because I think that there is a whole bunch of rubbish philosophy. I think the best philosophy are those who are like heavily conjoined with the practice of actual science. Right. And in fact, the philosophers tend to be scientists themselves. Like people like Daniel Dennett, who through his whole career has engaged in research in neuroscience or like cognitive science and, you know, these different fields related to the mind as part of his being a philosopher. Um, and I think that that's important. I think that's what every ph good philosopher does. And those who don't do it, I think they become ever more divorced from the actual, uh, you know, knowledge base that science has accumulated. And I they become more and more out of touch. We, the philosophy, philosophy is valuable only if it's in the philosophy of the hard sciences. <laughs> Not just the hard sciences, because, like, I think it's even valuable in history, for example. Like, so here's, like, another good thing is that you and I, you and, <laughs> you, you and I, Doug, we're, like, quite interested, both of us, we're quite interested in uh, questions around early Christianity and the New Testament, right? Yeah, because it's more for entertainment, though. Okay, but do you agree that, like, within the field of study of New Testament criticism, there's a bunch of crappy myth methods being used by the supposed experts in those fields? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, well, I agree with that, too. Do you know who I think of those best place to be able to clean up that mess? <laughs> the best place? Or the... Best placed. Like those in the best position. Oh, I see. Um, those who have taken hard science degrees in their life. <laughs> no, that's not the conclusion that I was going for. My, I, think, I think it's people who have, I think it's the people who are specialized in history and specialized in the philosophy of history, specifically the, the methods of history. Um, Didn't work out well for I, Michael Acona. But that's not what he's, that's not what his specialty is in. Well, history it is. Not in philosophy, though. No, no, not in philosophy. No, no, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the, those best place to clean up that mess of crappy methods are those people who have the conjunction of highly educated in philosophy and highly educated in history. Because, they're, because they probably studied epistemology when they went through philosophy, and they probably learned a whole bunch of things Can that you historians... Can who has both? Richard Garriott. Which is why he wrote a book on the methods of history. <laughs> yeah, and he's a trying to, tr trying to clean up some of the f the crappy mess of uh, Jesus studies methods that are invalid and lead to a whole bunch of contradictory conclusions. Hmm. But you, but he's he's an outcast. Well, I mean, that's his own fault in many ways, like, because he, first of all, I don't think that he was the right person to do it, given that he early in his career positioned himself as like an anti-theist, skeptic, critic of religion. Additionally, I don't think he did himself any favors because he chose to criticize with vitriol prominent people in the field like Bart Ehrman right at the moment in time that he was meant to be attempting to have an impact on the field with his research, like, <laughs> which is just like a, a dumb thing to do in your career, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, even if you want to do that, you should just bite your tongue because he's almost um, too, he's almost, he's almost too intelligent because he's, well, maybe too prideful. 
Because if he was a little bit smarter, I guess he would have the social skills to realize you don't talk that way and about other professionals in the field and so forth. But well, for him, like he just doesn't take any bullshit, and he wants to call bullshit when he sees it, and it doesn't matter to him from whom. But I find it weird because in his book, Proving History, which is just the book that I was attempting to praise, he does actually explicitly state that a job of a historian challenging a consensus in a field is to actually take the point of view and convince the consensus of it. But like that's in part a social process. It's like it's 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 to ignore our. Uh, reality of being human and the social way in which we function to think that you can do that just by logic alone <laughs> or evidence alone or something like that no it takes like social persuasion because like otherwise people don't listen to you yeah uh getting back to the video uh tom do you remember i think we were very close to the end of the q a session um but do you did i miss anything important you think uh, probably not really. What What would you give yourself as a grade? A, B, C, D, F? Uh, I don't know. I could have definitely explained things better, but it's probably B, I guess. What would you guys say? Well, I, I would go B minus. Um, let's, let me think about it. But I would usually say A for you, Tom. So <laughs> it's just I think that you started at a really cere cerebral level, like your yeah, you like it definitely felt that you weren't talking to the audience in this one. Um, right from your opening statement, it was m it was more technical than it usually is, um, more complex and harder to understand, and you also had to talk faster too. Because I think that you noticed that, like, you had to keep it under that eight minutes or ten minutes or whatever it was, um, and I think in the back and forth, like, you were probably more strident than <laughs> than, <laughs> but but at the same time, um, you definitely put him in his place a few times, and you like overall, I think that you had a much more compelling. Um, case for me and i don't think you understood a bunch of what you said but anyway carry on Doug. for me personally i would give you an a like because you entertained me i mean especially <laughs> my back and are forth. you entertained <laughs> yeah yes uh, you definitely get an a for, for entertainment um, like especially in those parts that made me crack up laughing <laughs> but i agree with cam that i think both of you um i i would say he did worse than you as far as convincing the audience I think, you know, there's going to be atheists who will cheer you on because these are just stupid Christians trying to defend stupid beliefs. And then there's going to be Christians just cheering Michael on because, hey, he's a he's in our team. He's on our team. He's in our camp. We've got to support him. But I think both of you weren't really resonating with people. Um, when you start bringing up uh, <laughs> PowerPoints of of uh neurology and and simulations and how it's just like christians if, you can tell me if i'm wrong but i think you're kind of like going what come on michael really and um so but again i was entertained and i i loved listening to that it, to me i think it was your best one next to um that clark guy professor clark i forget his david yeah. clark yeah because i think uh, just strictly on a debate level, I could tell you had uh, Michael apoplectic. Like he was like, "What are you? What are you dare tell? I'm, tell me I'm wrong." <laughs> it's like, um, so you had him definitely on the back foot for a while, and he was like shocked that you were so confident and bold in what you were saying, and um, so that's good. Maybe Thank that, you. Maybe, maybe, the maybe that alone convinces some people who are meant to be on the fence. It, it, it's sad to say, but people are convinced by confidence, right? It's like, whoa, Tom looks like a smart guy, confident guy. Maybe he's right. Yeah, so look, I definitely have to figure out a way to make that argument more compelling that we can't really justify metaphysical absolute claims or if we 
attribute absolute properties to something. There's no way we can justify that. I definitely have to find a more easily to intuitive way to under, to explain that. Uh, Z yonder, you're exactly right. I think I do need to talk with more Orthodox Christians. In fact, uh, Tom, if you had the email address of that guy you talked to recently, he was a Lutheran. Uh, Catholic, Lutheran. Was he? I thought he was Lutheran, but maybe he was Catholic. The guy on non sequitur show. Oh, uh, he, he yeah, was. Reverend. I don't yeah. have an email. I just got him, contacted him through non sequitur. Okay, I'll get it through Kyle because that's he's a guy I would love to talk to. He seemed like so affable and kind, and I liked him. Yeah, fun. But uh, Z yonder, the reason why I talked to the Protestants. Um, the evangelicals, the conservatives, the born again types, is because that's where I came from, and I know how they think. I really do. I know that sounds cocky, but um, I can relate to them. Plus, I think they're the most dangerous. Actually, I don't think the Orthodox are as dangerous. The Orthodox are more just tradition, tradition. Like, I always think of Fiddler on the Roof when I'm <laughs> talking to Orthodox people. I'm just reading the comments here. Joshua Van is having a go at you, Tom. <laughs> All bark, no bite. His confidence. Ignore the trolls. Oh, he's not. Well, I don't know if he's a troll. But <laughs> I actually like trolls as long as they make me laugh. If they don't make me laugh, then I get rid of them quickly. There's nothing, there's nothing more entertaining than an intelligent troll, and a funny troll. I gotta go to bed now. <laughs> it's tough work for me. <laughs> okay. Must be later for you guys. I know. I, I was trying to go for the record, Ken, for the longest. Last <laughs> Thanks, guys, for hanging out. Sorry, Tom, you must be exhausted. Well done, Tom. If you combine the entertainment grade with the, the actual grade, it's way higher. Thank you. Thank you. It's like a B plus. <laughs> well, take some time and I'll get some sleep. Okay, guys, have a great, great night. Talk to you again soon. <laughs>